Hello and welcome back everyone, we weave online and today I'm gonna continue the story what if M. Orochimaru was obsessed with Naruto part 3. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a big thumbs up and to watch more videos like this, subscribe to my channel and turn that bell notification on so you never miss an upload. Now wasting no more time, let's begin. Peruzin had never been apathetic to her smile. When she was young, it made him feel like a father and made him proud to be her teacher. When it was ready, it made him want her. But when their relationship ended, the cruelty behind it left him cold, sad, and mourning the loss of the innocent student he used to know. Now, it makes him hate them more than any cat in jutsu he has ever seen. He wants nothing more than to strangle her to death and then send her soul to the Shinigama for a snack. He asked, what do you want? With a sour tone, she said, Kyukuku, you seem to ask that a lot, sensei, and she was right, so he could stop it. He needed to know what her plan was and what she was trying to do. He would keep her away from Konoha until he died. Well, he replied, oh, nothing, just checking in. How's Asuma? He seemed really upset when we got back. Oh, she liked to twist the knife, thought Haruzen. She felt so good about herself. Do you like this? I've worked hard to fix my relationship with Asuma, and you're tearing it down for your own amusement. Not just for my amusement, that was a side effect. Besides, you only have yourself to blame. I bet you used the same old excuses you used on me. My shinobi need me, the civilians need me, and while I love them, even my family needs me. I just need time to be Haruzen, she said with a laugh. Haruzen jumped because he had just said the same thing to Asuma. He wanted his son to understand how hard it is to be Hakage, and how much the job takes over your life. Asuma didn't think it was true. You know it's a lie, right? Yes, I know it's a lie, she said. You could have just retired, and any of us were ready to take over. Instead, you stayed in power until after the Third Shinobi War. The truth is that you love being the Hakage, the god of shinobi, so much that you didn't have room for anyone else. I'm not going to argue with you about this, and if I have to be around your disgusting self, it should be for a good reason. What do you want? I heard that you took away our right to wear the Uzumaki symbol. Is that true? Oh, she's just trying to get to all your weak points today. He's your student, so you know it's true. Hi, but he went to sleep as soon as he got back, so we haven't been able to talk. Do you have any ideas for a replacement? Maybe you could hold a village-wide contest. To make my mistake even more clear. Yes, now you get it. She said with real excitement. What do you want? Where is this going? I won't let you hurt Kanoha. Hyukuku, why would I want to hurt Kanoha? I live here, and I wouldn't burn down my own house just to get back at you. Peruzin said in a dry tone, I don't believe that for a second. Okay, I might, but I'm not. That must mean something, sensei, right? Poets will write epics about how kind you are, he said. Then I've had a full and happy life, he said. What do you want again, Orochimaru? I want you to know that my Odonin have cleared the last of Danzo's known root bases. I can't say they killed all of them, but they got most of them. Haruzen said, good, if that's all you have to say, you may leave. When she did, he sighed. It took a lot of self-control for him not to hit the woman when he saw her, especially since she had just thrown away all the work he and Asuma had done to fix their relationship and hurt him more out of spite. He knew she hated him, which was partly fair, but when would it be enough? He could keep her in the village and watch her every move, but he couldn't get ahead of her until he knew what she really wanted. He couldn't get out of the position where he was just reacting to what she did. People don't realize how powerful small revenge can be, said Orochimaru as she left with a smile on her face. And she was sure that every time she did something small, the old monkey would keep thinking she had a big plan for him. In reality, though, she only had one plan, and it would be a few years before she could fully carry it out. When she thought about him, she started to think about the Rasa situation. She would have no trouble killing him in open battle. It wouldn't be a problem at all, but killing him would be something different. She couldn't just poison him with a snake or drive her Kusanagi through his heart. She realized that being an S-ranked missing nin had made her assassination skills rusty, especially when it came to hiding the fact that she was the one who did it. She hasn't cared in years if anyone found out she killed a target. Interesting. Time was on her side, and she knew Rasa well enough to be able to make some guesses. The most obvious reason is that he probably has the information set to be released when he dies, but he wouldn't put copies of it too far away from where he can control them. He didn't trust anyone, and he only put up with Baki because he was strong and could keep Gara in line. That would have to be explained, but she would give it to Jureya. He wouldn't stay out of it, just in case he was trying to set her up. She did have plans to blame him or kill him outright if he betrayed her, but she was smart enough to know that she probably wouldn't have to use these plans. Jiria wasn't the fool he let people think he was. He was as tough as any other war veteran, but when it came to Naruto, he was honest. 
her spies had found out that him staying away from Naruto wasn't all his idea, but she wouldn't admit it. Why should someone give in to emotional blackmail just because it's not true? That's crazy. She went back to the how after getting back on track. He had guards, so she would have to find out how loyal and careful they were about his safety. This could be a way to get close to him. Even though she didn't like the idea, she might be able to seduce him. She wasn't against seduction in general, but Rasa seemed like a crybaby, and she didn't want or need to deal with that. Or he'd be really bad because he thought too highly of himself and needed constant reassurance that he was good, big, or something else. Not worth the time she would put into it or the nice pants she would wear. As she walked home, she laughed to herself. She still had time, so she would come up with an idea. The three people just couldn't stand their one enemy. They have tried everything to get him to change, but nothing has worked. Even their best formations and most well-rehearsed attacks couldn't even touch him. It was more than frustrating, and the fact that they were all tired made their bad feelings even worse. The leader took a deep breath and then charged forward with his quarterstaff. A swing at the legs was blocked by a simple hop, and the next swing at the ribs was stopped by a simple rotation. The opponent wasn't happy with just being on defense, so he gave the person with the staff a kick that threw him off. The other two of the group finally got back into the fight, having gotten enough energy for one last attack. The smallest one came with her sword. It was a classic two-handed overhead strike aimed at the shoulder. The person it was meant for had to jump to the side to avoid it. The third member, who was the last one willing to help, then threw a series of shuriken at the target, who had to block them. The Kenjutsu user kept attacking him, not giving him any room to breathe. His downward, upward, and horizontal slashes all just missed him. With every attack you miss, your stamina goes down even more, making your legs shake. The person who knew how to use Bajutsu came back into the fight with a fury he hadn't shown before. The only defender blocked and deflected their attacks, but he didn't forget that a third person was hiding nearby. His patience paid off when the third person decided to join the attack. He thought it was time to stop. As soon as the third got close enough to hit, he quickly took the Bajutsu user's quarterstaff away and put him down with a palm strike. He threw the staff at the other two opponents without hesitating. The support ninja made the mistake of catching it, which left him open to an attack from above by the other opponent. The boy was knocked out with two kicks that were given with a spin. The attacker did some impressive acrobatics, landing on his back and kicking up right away so that his last enemy wouldn't even have a chance to move. When she saw she was alone, tired, and outmatched, she put her sword down in defeat. He smiled and rubbed her head right away. She got red in the face, but she hit his hand away. That's wrong. Well, why not Mogi-chan? You did great, and so did everyone else, Naruto said. All he got back were groans. Konohamaru said, you're too good, boss. We can't hit you. No, it's not that. I'm just moving a little faster than you guys. You just need to get a little more creative with your strategies. A direct attack can be useful, especially when you all have better skills. But when you're outmatched you have to find or make your own advantages and then use them, he said before looking to Yudon. You gave up on the support role too quickly, Yudon. It's a good idea to want to protect your team, but there are many ways to do so. If you had kept hitting me with Shuriken, you might have given Khan or Mogi a chance to attack. You need to learn how Khan and Mogi fight so you can lead opponents to where they're weakest, Naruto said. And Yudon looked down in shame or silent regret. However, you're on your way there. Early on, when they needed a break or some space, you gave it to them, and you're good at telling people what you're thinking. Once you start learning tactics and strategy in the academy, you'll be even better, and your shuriken jutsu is well trained for your age. Naruto finished, and the boy smiled brightly. Mogi-chan, what do you think is the most important thing for a swordsman or woman? Breathing. If you can control your breathing, you can keep your muscles from getting tense, which slows down your reactions and makes your strikes less fast and strong. Good. What comes next? The legs have to be strong, fast, steady, and quick. Right? When you were tired, you couldn't control your breathing and your legs were shaky. When that happens, you have to change things up. It takes dedication to learn kenjutsu, but you're not a samurai, so that's not all you'll use. He said, and she nodded, taking the criticism better than Yudon. But you're getting better and soon you'll be ready to learn something beyond the basics. Con, good staff work. Your speed and control are fine, but you need to control your emotions. As soon as you got angry, you started telegraphing your moves. If the other two are following your lead, you'll make them predictable, which is the one thing you don't want to be. Hi. So, now that we've gotten that out of the way, you guys are getting better here, Naruto said. Have a snack and some water. I have to meet my shishu soon. 
The three people did what they were told and talked about the academy and other things. Konohamaru begged Naruto to teach them some cool jutsu, and Naruto promised to show them something next time, something small to get them started. When he saw Abisu coming, he got up to leave. He thanked the man with a nod and left, happy that he got to spend time with the kids because it had been a while since he had seen them. Abisu said, Yuzumaki-san was right in his review. You should all pay attention to what he said. Yes, boss is cool. He's even a chunin now, exclaimed Konohamaru, and the other two nodded their heads in agreement. Yes, that's pretty cool. Are you three too tired to train some more? No, 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 they said. Abisu said, good, then let's practice controlling our chakras, and he fought the urge to laugh at their faces. I know for sure that Yuzumaki-san works on controlling his chakra all the time. It's one of the reasons why he's seen as an up-and-coming ninjutsu expert. The more control you have over your chakra, the more you can do with it. Fine, said Konohamaru with a sigh. All right, go get some leaves. Even though it's fun to train with Kon and the others, Naruto had to get to his training, and his shishu didn't look like it was going to hold back today. His different grunts of pain would make that clear. The goal was to teach him how to deal with opponents who were faster than him by making him faster and more aware. Ugh, he wasn't getting anywhere. Get up, Naruto-kun. I didn't even hit you hard. Naruto got up off the ground and said, I think we both know that's not true. Okay, Kyukyuko, but you're so tough. None of my other training dummies can last as long as you. Naruto replied with a deadpan, I'm really feeling the love here, Shishu. That's what happens when you get older. I do have standards. Orochimaru shot back before attacking again. He would only be able to avoid her blows, a quick sound, or a change in the wind by the narrowest of margins. It wasn't much, and sometimes he didn't know much more than what he thought. When he ducked, her leg touched the top of his head. He moved forward and stopped her leg sweep. He didn't think, so he did a mule kick that hit her arms and made her stop for a moment, giving Naruto enough time to attack. Naruto held onto her forearm and used the surface walking technique to bring his other leg up for another kick. She stopped it easily and pulsed her chakra to get her student out of the way. Naruto didn't let the fact that he was losing his advantage stop him from punching her in the face, but she dodged it easily and threw the red-haired Yuzumaki away while still holding his leg. Naruto got back on his feet while he was in the air, but he had to go back into evasion mode when she started to attack again and again. Even with his improved stamina, Naruto was getting tired from having to fight above his level. He was getting slower, but not sloppy, because his time with the Panthers had taught him how to hold himself even when tired. It didn't stop her from picking him apart while she potshot Naruto until he fell to the ground and was gasping for air. All right, that's enough, she said. Good, because I don't think you could hit me anywhere else. It's better for me to do it than for an enemy to do it, Naruto-kun. Also, as expected, you're getting better, she said with a twinkle in her eyes. Why? Don't force me to say it. We made a deal, and Naruto Uzumaki doesn't go back on his word, as far as I know. Stupid stupid me, why couldn't my nindo be that I'd eat as much ramen as I can? Stop stalling, fine, I'm getting better because you, Shishusama, are the best Sanin and the best Kanoichi in the world. See, that wasn't so hard. How are things going with everything else? Are your clones training with the Kiri swords? Two of them, Samehata hasn't accepted me yet, and I'm not going to be a meal for a sword. And the Kubichi Kubikiri Zabuza's sword is too big for my body. Even the name is hard to say. Orochimaru said with a wink, Kubikirabacho. Well, look at that, I guess I can handle a mouthful. Hyukuku, for future reference, which made Naruto blush a little bit. You should make a deal with Samhata, it's too useful not to. Now, how's your ninjutsu? Have you learned anything new? Maybe a few changes. I wanted to know for sure before I came to talk to you, so you know that we've been making plans for any pair of Akatsuki I might meet. Yes, you seemed sure that your plans for Kakuzu and Hidden would work, but you thought Sasori and Deidara would cause trouble for you and your team. Naruto said, Yeah, I might have the Sasori part figured out, even though he's a nightmare for Kurenai-sensei, Shino, and Shika. But Deidara was the hardest to plan for, since he's a long-range threat and my weakest element is his natural counter. She nodded. It's hard and inefficient to use Raiden Jutsu over a long distance. That's what most people think. Are you going to show me something else? She asked with excitement. Yep. Watch. Naruto said before using lightning style, lightning beast running Jutsu, and seeing the normal looking Raiden stop moving at 10 meters. Orochimaru didn't look confused or upset. She knew that Naruto wouldn't waste her time, so she waited patiently for him to continue. Naruto then ran through the same hand signs and did the jutsu again. But this time the beast was red and didn't give up until it was 25 meters away. I wonder if red lightning is the same as Kumo's black lightning. 
I don't know. But I think black lightning is stronger than regular Raiden techniques. Red lightning isn't really stronger, but it can go farther and do something else. What? Naruto then threw four kunai that were 15 meters apart and then used another red lightning jutsu on the kunai in the middle. To Orochimaru's surprise, when the jutsu hit the other kunai, it split apart and hit the other one. I called that my chained lightning jutsu. A normal lightning technique is easy to avoid if you're not the intended target. But the red lightning seeks out other conductors. The best part is that chakra sources fall into that category. I lost a lot of clones to that one. Could it be made to focus on a certain goal? Maybe if I were more of a sensor. Karin move chan's not working out too well. She asked. No, there's a block. I feel like I'm almost there. But I won't get very far until it's fixed. Keep trying. You'll figure it out. But even now you continue to impress me. Orochimaru said after a moment of thought. I'd suggest developing a focus piercing attack to go with your wide area effect attack. I'll give it some clones, Shishu, he said. Good, good. Is there anything else new? Here are some rough ideas. I'll let you know when I have something more solid. Great. Now that you've had enough rest, open your sword so we can practice your kenjutsu. Awesome. Let's get crazy, Shishu. Naruto said as he took his katana out of its sheath. Oh, Naruto-kun, so eager to penetrate me. Don't say things like that, Tebeo. Naruto yelled as he tried to hide his red face. Kabuto was annoyed that he had to stop what he was doing to answer the door. He knew his mistress would not let the Uzumaki interrupt her training. And since everyone else was gone, it was up to him. The Nara on the other side of the door didn't surprise him, and he led him to the Uzumaki. But when he heard a female giggle from the training grounds, he stumbled. The white snake didn't giggle. She laughed in a way that showed she was better, like a predator taunting its prey. When she laughed, it sent shivers down your spine as you waited for her to kill you or gave you a feeling of dread because you thought she knew something you didn't. She is not laughing. And yet, he knows what he heard, and it was just one of the many things that bothered him about their time here. Or really, since her interest in the Uzumaki turned into something more. They haven't tortured anyone together in two months. When they were killing Rutnin, she didn't even try to break their minds. Just stab, 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 stab. No artistry. The Nara and the Uzumaki left, but Kabuto was still staring at Orochimaru. This was always scary. But it was especially scary for someone who knew what she was really capable of. Kabuto-kun, you need to deal with whatever has been bothering you lately, she said simply. And he just nodded. She was right, he did need to deal with his problem. Itachi left work when Naruto said he wanted to go to the annual Inoshikacho picnic. He was due for a shift change but had to report to the Sandame first. The Sandame thinks Orochimaru is up to something and wants to turn Naruto against the village. It's a reasonable fear, but Itachi hasn't seen any attempt to do so. The Hakage told his most loyal ANBU report, and they did. There's nothing to tell, Hakage-sama. She has continued to train the same way she did when she first started to learn from him. How is he getting along? Well, Hakage-sama, no matter what his body can't do, they find ways to work around it, and he listens well when she teaches him about tactics. And his ninjutsu, innovative, he seems to show something new all the time, which is scary. He might be even better at making jutsu than the nidam. I've been there, so I know it's a high bar. So, what do you think of him? He wouldn't be a natural genius like Kakashi and me. He's a genius, and his work has more than earned him the name but he's hard to put in a box. What do you mean? Haruzen was interested. By today's standards, he is talented, but he gets by mostly on his hard work. It's not wrong, but it misses the point. I think the only way to really understand Naruto-kun is to compare him to himself. His path will be different from everyone else's, and rules won't matter to him. A paradigm shift. People could do great things with what was known, like a child who gets perfect scores on every test. But there were a few who thought so differently that they couldn't be understood by what was already known. They broke the mold. Someone like that could be hard to train because a sensei who wanted to use the tried and true would have a hard time figuring out how to reach them. It hurt Haruzen to think this, but Naruto's lack of care might have been the best thing for him. With no one to tell him he was wrong or wasting time, Naruto could grow in a way no one else had. He didn't know what was possible or not and his Uzumaki stubbornness would make sure he wouldn't say something was impossible until he was sure of it. The village sensor corp said that Naruto's chakra capacity was growing all the time, which meant that he could do things at a younger age than almost anyone before him. Add in shadow clones, and the boy's potential was almost limitless. Only time and imagination could stop him. It was a scary thought. No way I could get you to teach me a certain jutsu. Sorry, Hakage-sama, but until Naruto teaches another, it's a clan jutsu. No clues. And sorry, Hakage-sama. Weasel, that's fine. 
Do you have anything else to say? He asked, and Itachi said no by shaking his head. So, nothing to make me stop and think. Asked the Hakage. Nothing that looks bad from the outside. Hakage-sama. Itachi, what do you mean by that? We know she likes Naruto and might be trying to get him ready for something. What was the only question? I think she might be making him into the man she wants to be with Itachi gave a dry answer. And he could see that Sandame was upset by it. The what? He said in disbelief. Paramore. Her future lover, Hakage-sama. Haruzen said, I know what a paramour is, child. His mind was elsewhere as he thought about what his vile student had planned. Did she want a repeat of the past? A long-term relationship with Naruto only to hurt him so badly that he too turns to the darkness. Minato's son being called a traitor and using all of his skills and power to attack the leaf. That would be bad. Beyond bad. But it would be a fitting revenge for. He had always known he had to get her away from him. There were only so many ways to do that. With the upcoming attack on AIM, he could try to make sure she didn't survive. But if that didn't work, he'd be damned. If she were ready and told Naruto, he'd believe her without question. Once again, she was so far ahead of him that the game was half over before he realized he was playing. Naruto was meant for great things. He has the drive to become something special. He couldn't let her break him. That he had helped grow. A seed that had grown and was now trying to grow more seeds. A cycle he had started, based on his own selfishness and pride. He couldn't let that be the end of his long life. He was a flawed man, but not an evil one. He had tried to find peace when he could and lived to protect the king of the village. He would save Naruto from her. Thank you, Weasel. You're free to go. The ANBU left right away. Haruzen then spoke to the ANBU still in his office. Get Anko Mitarashi. He said. He didn't like this annual gathering, which was a celebration of the long-standing alliance between the three clans. There were too many people and too much interaction. As the heir, it was expected of him, but it was a mind-numbing waste of time. He accepted it, but why couldn't people try not to be annoying? And what was with the sudden interest in his teammate? Stop ignoring me, Shika. Don't call me Shika, you annoying blonde, she said. You let Naruto call you Shika. Well, that's between him and me. Okay, keep doing that. I was just trying to find out more about the person on your team. Yes, and I'd like to know why. Why are you so interested now, Eno? What do you really want? If you just want to talk about other people, you should stop. That's not what it's about, he said. No longer, she thought when we were at the academy, I told Sakura that he was a bad person and she shouldn't be his friend. We were only six people, and I went by what everyone else said. I wasn't sure if it was true, but I thought I was doing the right thing. Why should this matter to me? Because he does. I tried to talk to the new girls in his clan, but they knew I was the one who made his friend leave, so they wouldn't even talk to me. Shikamaru said, Okay, then there's nothing to do. He knew Naruto probably didn't care, that the story was more of a reference point than anything else, but it wasn't his job to tell her that and he didn't see any reason to help her. Ino was selfish, vain, and self-centered. She had written Naruto off before she even met him and hadn't cared about him until he became a clan heir. But I want to say sorry and try again. Shikamaru sighed. He had to be clear, because Ino wouldn't understand subtlety or be led to a conclusion. He had to say it straight out why. You didn't care when we made our teams, you thought he was a loser even though you had almost no proof. I told you that was wrong, but you didn't listen. But now that he is the heir to the clan and has shown some skills, you want to lie. Don't bother him, Eno. A lot of people will be here. There's no point in bothering someone you didn't want to talk to five minutes ago. So, is that all? I can't get better. Can't do anything to make things better. You haven't changed, so no. Which is fine, no one cares, but don't make this sound like something it isn't. It's just too much trouble. Eno said in a huff, wow, that's a great way to be a friend, Shikamaru. We're friends. Shikamaru was surprised by what Eno said. Of course we are, we've been friends for a long time. We're not friends anymore. This is so annoying. Fine, then, Shikamaru. I won't bother you because I'm so bad, okay. Ino spoke back with her hands on her hips. Really not. Asshole. You'll get over it. Shino was dressed like a stereotypical aburaim, with a big jacket, black pants, and sunglasses. Naruto was wearing a red, long-sleeved, v-neck shirt with black pants and his hair pulled back in a loose bun. She had to admit that the often maligned man bun worked on him. Hi, Shika. Hi, Ino-san, Naruto said with a wave, and then he looked around to see her. Troublesome. H. Hello, Naruto-san. Shino, she said, surprised by how happy he was. Naruto-san, can I talk to you for a moment? Sure, he said, and he followed her away from his teammates. When he saw that she looked confused, he stopped being polite Ino, how can I help you? I'm sorry, Naruto, that I told Sekira not to be your friend. 
It was mean, but I thought I was being kind. And sorry. Oh, has that been giving you trouble? We were kids back then, so I understand. Really? Yeah. You didn't think that something a six-year-old did to me would make me angry, did you? He asked with a smile. She said, I wasn't sure, which made her feel much better. Well, I'll let you go back to Shikamaru. Thanks, Naruto, Ino said as she left. Naruto called back, no problem, and then walked over to Shikamaru and Shino. Did you make things right with her? But it was strange. Anyway, how are you guys? I am well, Naruto-san. How did your trip to Suna go? Fine, some fighting, some eating, and some making friends. Shikamaru muttered, of course you did, which made Naruto laugh. The three of them made some food and went to a place away from the crowds where they talked about their training, missions, and Shikamaru's long list of complaints. So, because of you, you troublesome redhead, I have to buy a new vest. Even if you don't need a tighter fit, you should fire your tailor, Shika. Shino was helpful and said, I know a guy. Naruto gave him a thumbs up. See, Shino even knows a guy. Naruto said after taking a moment to think about what Shino had said why am I not friends with any guys. Aburame, I won't let you get ahead of me. I already am, though. Why? You've already said that you don't have any guys. Since I have enough, I will win. Is this really what we want to talk about? Is this thing really going on? I have to ask you to be quiet, Shikamaru-san, because Naruto-san is about to give up. I take nothing back. Just wait, I'll have guys who are better than yours. This point of view is stupid. Shikamaru said, you both need to realize this, but neither of them was paying attention. Hey, you two annoying teammates, don't ignore me. You always end up in these silly competitions with each other. They both said, he started it, it started with him. But Shikamaru's sweat didn't form a drop because it was too much trouble. Can we get back to what we were talking about? No, Shikamaru-san, we cannot. Not until Naruto-san says once more that he has lost. Last time, you lied, Tebeo. What about before that? The problem wasn't clear. Naruto said with his hair flying all over the place. You put in the challenge, which is a pain. How could you get so mixed up? Shino answered with just a hint of amusement. I think it would be pretty easy. Aburame has the sword. You know you're both jerks, right? Shikamaru yawned and said, what's that? I can't hear you from down there. Shika, you're lying down. When you're lying down, your height doesn't even matter. Shino, do you hear what I say? It sounds like a little girl shrieking. Why? Because a boy may have a high-pitched voice before his balls drop. Oh, you want to play it that way? Fine, I'm having a water whip party, and both of you are welcome. Naruto said with white eyes and hair that looked like nine tails. He made the water whips right away and chased after his teammates. Shino, you may have gone too far this time. And running is such a pain Shikamaru looked around as he tried to avoid Naruto's whips. Shino replied, barely avoiding a whip himself, such is the price of victory, Shikamaru-san. Troublesome. He wanted to go home because it was late and he'd had a long and stressful day. It was always around this time that he wondered if he should just give Tsunade the seat and be done with it. He could still lead them through the aim attack while leaving the day-to-day -day work to her. She might not like it and might fight him tooth and nail, but it would be worth it to get out of that seat. Haruzen, has that stupid mind of yours gone completely crazy? Even though I'm still the Hakage, Koharu, why are you talking to me like this? If you give Anko a mission, she will, and I quote, leave me gutted and rotting in a grave without a headstone. Anko was exaggerating, but I'm sure you both agree that we can't let Orochimaru taint Naruto-kun. She can't be allowed to bring darkness to Minato's son. Oh, he's Minato's son now. Do we really care about that? Hamura said, we don't need to argue about that tonight, Koharu. Even though he didn't like how Haruzen used them. They didn't want to take Naruto's heritage away from him. But they were worried about his lack of protection and the assassins who might come after Minato's legacy. Both of them were upset to find out that wasn't the only reason Haruzen did what he did. But they hadn't talked about it yet. It always seemed like there was something more important to do. Fine, we won't do that tonight. But Haruzen, you're making a mistake. Worse yet, you're being obvious and sexist. Anko is one of our best Kanoichi, so you send her on a mission to fuck a child. You wouldn't send Kakashi to screw a 12-year-old girl, and we all know that. I didn't tell her to have sex, and seduction doesn't have to end in sex. It would be enough if she just made him fall in love with her. Did she tell you why I wanted her to do it? Yes, and you're being unreasonable. Even if she did like Naruto, that's not against the law, and we don't punish our shinobi without proof of wrongdoing. We're not Danzo, Hamura said. Also, why are you so sure that she must have bad plans for Naruto? Why come back here and give us full access to her own hidden village if she has some evil plan? She may be arrogant, but she's not stupid, so why make this harder than it needs to be? Naruto had plenty of reasons to leave the village, so she wouldn't have had to try hard to get him to do so. 
because it would be her ultimate revenge on Minato and me, and it's the kind of sick poetry she likes. Haruzen defended himself, but he could see that Koharu wasn't convinced. Hamura, on the other hand, understood what the man was saying. When Koharu saw how Hamura looked, she knew she was out of the loop. Why don't you tell me something? Haruzen took a deep breath in and then sighed it out. For a short time, Orochimaru and I were having an affair. I sent her to Danzo to end it, to try to save my marriage, and to deal with the guilt of forcing her to have an abortion. Haruzen didn't have to wait long for the slap that came after he told his wife about the affair. Oh, you're one of them. I thought better of you, Haruzen. I thought you had more honor and discipline than that. I'm sorry I let you down, but I can't change what happened, and that can't be an excuse to ignore what she did. No, but it does give some background. I watched that girl grow up, along with Tsunade. I wasn't their direct sensei, but I was proud to have helped them become the great Kanoichi they were. It hurt me just as much as it hurt you when she turned bad. It never made sense. She had darkness, she could be sadistic, but she always had control. Always. And then all of a sudden she becomes a monster. It never made sense, until now. She and. Yes, it has, and I want to fix it. Don't you see why I need to limit all of her power over him? I think the old man is overreacting. Or maybe you don't want Naruto to get something that used to be yours. I'm not that rude, Koharu. This isn't about some lingering possessiveness. Maybe not. But we don't think it's a good idea to send Anko on this mission. If you had more proof or a better reason, that would be fine. But her just being spiteful won't do. And as one of the daimyo's rules, you know we can overrule you if we both agree. We do, Haruzen. This mission is cancelled. You're both doing something wrong. Koharu asked Haruzen. Only time will tell. But have you ever thought that maybe Naruto could be a good influence on her and bring back the loyal Kanoichi she used to be? Maybe if you were older, but he's still a kid in a lot of ways. And that child rallied a nation to fight for itself. He might surprise you, they both might if you give them a chance, she said as both advisors left, leaving the longest serving Hakage to his own thoughts. But no matter how hard he tried, he just couldn't imagine a scenario where Naruto didn't turn out badly. The two female Sanon were sitting in a very fancy room. There are bookshelves all the way to the ceiling and fine woodwork with jade accents all over the office. The office is well made and well kept, as it should be for a shinobi elder and former student of Tabarama Senju. Orochimaru said, I didn't think you could wake up this early. Tsunade replied, I don't want to be up this early. On top of that, I haven't done anything, so I don't know why I'm even here. Orochimaru thought, maybe she wants an audience. You're due for a smack in the behind, so it's possible. Tsunade said with a small smile. And you're not. I pretty much just retired. And your situation is different from mine. A third voice said from behind them, I see you two still fight like schoolgirls. Koharu asked them to come to her estate at 7am. As soon as she left Haruzen's office, she sent out a notice. Clearly, she hadn't been told about some important things and wanted to clear things up. She did for Tsunade and Orochimaru what Maito Sama had done for her. The talented Yuzumaki didn't want Koharu to be the weak link on her team. She wanted the tradition to continue, but wars and other tragedies killed everyone she chose for the job, with Kushina being the last. But it wasn't meant to be. Her original girls were back, though, so maybe it could still work out. But first, everything would have to be out in the open. There will be no more secrets or lies. Thank you both for coming so early. It's great to see you. Tsunade replied, it's good to see you, too. Is it? Because you've been back for almost two months, and I haven't seen either of you since we first met. If I didn't know better, I'd think you were trying to avoid me. Tsunade quickly replied, I've been busy with work at the hospital and my own training. I thought you wouldn't want to see me, Orochimaru said simply, with no emotion in her voice. I should cane you both. Tsunade, you're never that busy. And you, of course I'd want to see you, girl. Why didn't you tell me what was going on between you and Haruzen? Why didn't you come to me? I wouldn't have said anything during the affair, and what could I say afterward? It was so common that it didn't deserve any more attention. Yes, it did. The affair was wrong. You and Haruzen were both wrong, but Haruzen was worse. He was your sensei and your boss, so he had no right to be involved in such things. And what he asked of you. If you'd told me earlier, I would have been able to do more than slap him. You slapped sensei. Tsunade asked in mild surprise. Of course I did. He should have known better and this could have been avoided. It doesn't matter what you know. Of course it does. It doesn't excuse what you did, but it explains why you did it. We worked hard to help you control your impulses, and for years you did. But when Tsunade died, you needed someone else to keep you in line. And it was clear that wasn't going to be Danzo. If he were still alive, I'd shave layers off his bones, Koharu said with disgust. I wasn't sad, and I'm not what you think I am. Clearly, it was always going to happen, and I could only pretend for so long. 
am a lot of things, most of them bad, but I won't be reduced to a heartbroken little girl. And yet, that's exactly what you were. Caring about him or anyone else in the future doesn't make you weak, Koharu said. And Orochimaru narrowed her eyes. Haruzen knows about it and was going to send Anko to stop it. Luckily, she was smart enough to come to me, even though she was mostly afraid you'd kill her. Orochimaru muttered, smart girl. He didn't like acting like a child in front of the older Konoichi. Wait, Orochi likes someone. Who is it? This is not a chit-chat group, Orochimaru said. If that isn't proof, I don't know what is. So, who's the lucky guy? Anyone I know? Orochimaru asked Koharu. Why did you have to bring this up in front of her? You know how emotional she can get. Which made Tsunade look angry. Koharu said, If you came to see me once in a while, I wouldn't have to deal with everything at once. This is really your fault. But she wasn't just trying to shame her as a mother. And Tsunade, wipe that look off your face. You're as sweet as they come, you just hide it under a layer of bitterness. Also, use that sharp mind if you want to know. The list isn't that long, she said, waving away Orochimaru's stare. Tsunade did as she was told and used her brain. She knew Orochimaru didn't hang out with that many people, and the fact that she thought the target was male cut that number down even more. Really, she spent most of her time with Kabuto, and the Kaguya seemed too submissive for her, so she spent most of her time with. Got a thing for redheads, huh? She asked with a smug look on her face. True, he was too young right now, and it would be considered bad manners to claim a child, but she didn't mind it when he was older. Shut up, she said. Orochimaru was never embarrassed, but she did not like this at all. She didn't care who knew she liked Naruto, and she didn't feel bad about being attracted to someone so much younger than her. But she felt too exposed around these two, who knew her best and had always liked her, even when she did things to push them away. She could never scare them, make them afraid, or do anything else to them. Even worse, Tsunade would sometimes tease her. And, unlike Juria's insults, which were meant to be funny but always had a hint of mocking jealousy, Tsunade's were always meant to include everyone. She cared what they thought and about them. That's why she didn't like how they judged her, even though in the end they were positive and accepting. Would she have changed if it hadn't been? Doubt herself. She didn't like that the answer was no to the first question and maybe yes to the second. Doubt and not knowing what to do slowed someone down and made them fall. When Tsunade spoke, she broke Orochimaru out of her thoughts. What? He's cute now, and I think he'll grow up to be a great young man. Yes, I do. Well, I didn't ask your permission, she said. I think that's as close as we're going to get to a thanks for the help, Tsunade said with a smile. She liked seeing her friend start to talk again. But soon, the smile disappeared when she thought of something that made her frown. The other two women didn't like how her feelings had changed. Sensei was going to have Anko try to get Naruto to like her. Koharu replied, yes, a sitting Hakage was going to try to get involved in clan politics directly. I, I didn't even think of that, and neither did Hamura, Haruzen said. He was really getting worse. If the other clans found out that he was trying to put a matriarch in a clan he had already stolen from, it could cause a lot of mistrust. It could be seen as Haruzen trying to get more money from the Uzumaki clan by getting close to the clan leader or even as a long-term plan to steal money. At the very least, it was breaking down the laws and traditions that gave clans some freedom. If this had happened, and it was ever found out, Haruzen would have been shamed even more. A bigger problem in what was otherwise a great two-term. Orochi-chan, I know you hate him, and I understand why, but as a favor to me, please drop this. I'd be lying if I said I'd completely drop it, and I won't, but it's not worth much right now. If he doesn't try anything like this again, it can stay locked up. I can live with that, and I'll tell Haruzen. Now, as fun as it is to talk about your courtship and guilt you both, I did have another reason to call you here. As you both know, I've been a sort of mentor to many of the village's Kanoichi, starting with you two. I've enjoyed it and been proud to do it, but my time is coming to an end. I'm old, and the younger generations need new voices and influences. I, I won't take on another full-time student. Once I work through my problems, I put everything I had into training Shizun. I'm not asking you to take on another apprentice, Tsunade, just like you weren't mine. Just be available and share your knowledge and experiences. You already know that people have different standards for Kanoichi, and that they don't take them seriously. But fangirls are going to ruin us all, said Tsunade with a fake look of horror, making the other three women laugh. Okay, I'll see what I can do. I'm already doing something similar with our medical corp. And you, what about me? If they aren't scared of me, they don't trust me. Besides, I've done enough of that in my own village, where two of the people I scared have joined Konoha. Yes, the extra Yuzumaki. You might be right, but you need to make up with Anko. Orochimaru said in a dry voice, that's not going to happen. And yet, it must. She can't move forward because she hates you and is afraid of that seal. 
fine, you annoying old lady. Do you want anything else? Now, it would be nice to be young again. I might hitch a ride on a certain redhead, Koharu said, laughing at the shocked looks on the faces of the two Sanin in front of her. Can I just say, for the record, that I don't want to do this? Asked the Nara genius as he cleaned up the training grounds. Kira and I replied, that's fine, Shikamaru. But since you rarely want to do anything, the news doesn't mean much. The red-eyed Jounin told her team, This will also help you figure out where you stand in comparison to the others. Because we may be given higher ranked solo missions, we need to know how to disable teams while still having enough energy to get away or finish our tasks. The Jenin teams should be able to take down a single rookie Chunin. No matter what happens, it will show us all where we can improve. Yes, except for one troublesome redhead who throws the whole thing out of whack. I still haven't done anything. His team told him, but you'll do it. You always do. Give it time. This made him feel sad and put a cloud over his head. You guys treat me so badly. Don't be like that. Naruto-kun, Kirin I said, rubbing the boy's head and making him blush a little. But Shikamaru makes a good point. Even though you're a rookie chunin, we all know that's not really the case. So the other Jounin senseis and I came up with some rules to keep you from messing up the whole thing. Okay, tell me about them. No shadow and few in clones. No ninjutsu above B rank. No overloading your lower rank jutsu to get similar effects. No kenjutsu. This is it. I don't want to do it. Shino isn't making a fuss. I can't wait for the chance to crush their naive confidence with my power. There's nothing more pure than that, sensei. Okay, said Kirinai, and she pulled out three scrolls, one black, one green, and one orange, and gave each of her students one. Go to the places I told you to go, because we're about to start. Shikamaru, if you just give up and hand over your scroll, you'll have to fight Naruto to the death as punishment. Shikamaru just took his scroll and walked away, cursing the fact that he had to work with a confusing woman and a troublesome Yuzumaki. The other two Chunin also left, and Kirinai did nothing but wait for the other teams to get there. Even Kakashi got there on time, so it was about 30 minutes. Asuma was the first to speak. Okay, teams, we're doing a joint training exercise. Each member of Team Kirinai has a scroll that you need to get. They're stationed in three different places and can't leave the general area. You can try to get the scrolls in any way that doesn't kill or maim. But if you lose to the Chunin, you can't attack them again. Neji asked, but if another group has the scroll, we can go after them. Yes, you get one shot at the Chunin, but as long as you can still fight, you can try to steal it from any of the other teams. The team that gets all the scrolls or has the most at the end of the time limit wins. Treat this like a real mission, Kirin I said. If any member of my team can put you in a position where you'd run away or give up, you've failed and must move on. If you keep going in those situations because you think this isn't real, you will have failed even if you get the scroll. You all have time to plan and strategize, and that time starts when the first team leaves the clearing, Kakashi said. But be careful, because that gives Shino, Shikamaru, and Naruto time to trap and fortify their positions, so waiting may not be in your best interest. As the three teams of Genin split up, so did the other Jounin. What do you think, Neji? Asked Tenten. Neji grabbed his prosthetic arm and said, I say we go after the Yuzumaki. I can see through his traps, and we can finally settle the score. Yes, let's have a very young fight and make our fires burn even brighter. Tenten finished, and Team 9 was happy with their plan. After that, should we just wait to see if any of the other teams get a scroll, and then go after them? Ino said, I think we should go after Shikamaru. He's so lazy that he won't even put up much of a fight. Chaoji added, but he's very smart, so he might have set traps or done any number of other things. No, he's too lazy to do that. Besides, we can beat him quickly, go to whoever is closest to Shikamaru, and then hide. Inada said, each team has a tracker. It won't be easy to hide, and with two scrolls, we'll be the targets. Then, Chaoji asked Hinata, what should we do? Stay here. Each team is going to try to take a scroll from another team at some point. Hoping that a member of Team Kirinai has worn them out so most of the work is done. If we all chase after a scroll, we'll all be exhausted and then exhausted even more when we fight. If we let the two combat teams go after a scroll, and then fight each other, then they'll be weakened and we can swoop in. So, your plan is to just wait. Yes, Inosan, that's what I have in mind. I like it, Choji said. I say we go after Shino. My cat and Jutsu are natural enemies of his insects, and the Sharingan will let me see them. You can keep track of Kiba, and Sekura can help us from far away if we need to. What will happen after that, if we beat Shino? Asked Kiba. If we need to, we'll rest, and then we'll go after Naruto. I assume Team 9 will go after him first to get their revenge. If they fight for a long time, it'll leave us with some weaker enemies. We'll get the second scroll, then head to the clearing and play defense with what we have. Kiba added, what if Team 9 is still new? 
they'll be hard to beat. It's a risk, but with Nara's shadow jutsu, one of us could get caught, and if that happens, we lose. Team 9 was the first to start moving, which started the timer for the exercise. Neji activated his Byakugan and ran toward the Uzumaki. He saw the chakra infused Fuenjutsu and led his team through the traps set in the woods. He also avoided the traps that didn't use chakra. Things were going well for Team 9 until Tendon stepped on a sinking patch of earth, which set off a kunai trap. The kunai. It was annoying that they had to move slowly and carefully to make sure there wasn't even the slightest mistake. This was especially true for Lee who liked to rush through problems, as it only made his youthful fires burn hotter. After 15 minutes of walking through the woods, the team came to a clearing where Naruto was waiting for them. Neji told them that the Yuzumaki hadn't moved since the exercise began, as if he were waiting to fight them head on. Everyone on Team 9 liked that and took their positions for their attack formation. Tenten started by throwing a barrage of kunai at Naruto, but he blocked them with the wind style, Wind Wall Jutsu Neji and Lee were already moving because they thought Naruto would have to move, but after the Jutsu's effects wore off, they kept going and got ready to attack. Naruto threw a Raten charged Kanai at Neji, who easily dodged it. The brief pause gave Naruto time to use another Jutsu, Water Style, Gummy Swamp Jutsu, one of his first usable, original Ju. Neji decided to keep going because he thought that between Tenten and him, the Hyuga was in the best position to go on the attack. After what she went through in the Chunin exams, Tenten didn't want to face a Futon user because she hadn't made any counters yet. She saw Lee struggling to get free and went to help her loud teammate. Neji finally got close enough to attack, his Byakugan blazing fiercely. He knew he couldn't kill Naruto, but he would be satisfied for now if he could severely hurt him. Naruto was ready for Neji's frontal attack, having pulled out two kunai from his holster. When it looked like Neji didn't care about the knives, probably because he thought they wouldn't touch him, Naruto decided to dispro. Neji saw the manipulation and knew he was in a lot of danger if he kept being too aggressive. He calmed down but kept the pressure on, just being more focused and in control. The chakra-infused knives made a few cuts, but they weren't deep enough to draw much blood, and Neji was glad he had trained with Tenten because the small cuts didn't stop him. He eventually figured out the timing and attack, counter patterns of the Uzumaki and set up a trap. He attacked in such a way that Naruto left his chest open for a palm strike. Neji took full advantage of the opening, his chakra charged palm speeding toward Naruto, ill will rolling off of him. He struck but was upset to see Naruto replace himself with a log. He almost missed the ceiling array on the log but caught it in time to do a chitin. Lee ran to help his teammate Neji when he saw that he was hurt. It was a good thing he did, because he was able to stop Naruto from grabbing Neji. In a flash, he was in front of Naruto, aiming a punch at the smaller Chunin. Naruto dodged the punch and slapped it away. Lee responded with a kick aimed at Naruto's midsection. Naruto met the kick. Lee didn't fight Naruto when he forced Lee's leg down to the ground and then into the ground, making Lee's foot sink. Before Lee could start to figure out what just happened, which was really just basic earth manipulation, Naruto hit Lee in the chin with a jab. The Raten Chakra, which made Naruto faster, allowed him to multiply the force of the jab, and Lee was knocked out. The newly promoted Chunin put a kanai to Lee's throat and used the boy, who couldn't move, as a shield. He said in a calm voice, drop all of your weapons and admit defeat, or I'll cut his throat. Tenten looked at her teammates. Neji couldn't move and Lee was at the bastard's mercy. She hung her head in shame. They'd lost. It was fast, it was effective, and they barely had a chance. It only made them dislike Naruto more because they felt he had embarrassed them again with little effort. Team 7 wasted no time taking off towards Shino when Team 9 departed. Kiba was taking the lead as he was tracking Shino by scent. Sekiro was behind him and Sasuke took the rear, making sure to avoid any of Shino's kakechu that he may have left behind. As they got closer to Shino's location, Kiba tripped a wire which triggered a series of pepper bombs being unleashed from above. The instant the pepper concoction spread Kiba had a coughing and wheezing fit, hard enough to throw Akamaru off of him. The bombs acted as an irritant to not only Kiba's sense of smell but to Sasuke's eyes. The Uchiha didn't quite close them fast enough which caused a burning sensation, one that the other members of Team 7 were experiencing as well. Immediately they cleansed their eyes with their water canteens and prepared to continue on. Kiba went to retrieve Akamaru, who seemed stunned from being tossed. When Kiba picked up Akamaru, the dog dissolved into a mass of Kakechu and latched onto Kiba. The Inuzuka attempted to get the insects off him by rolling around and even hitting himself but it was for naught as soon he was drained and passed out from chakra loss. Sasuke heard a gasp and turned around to see Shino had Sakura, a sigh pointed toward her midsection. 
With his sharing and activated he saw it was the real one, not a clone. He was frustrated his team had been so easily defeated by Trix. He didn't force Shino to make his ultimatum, throwing down his weapons and saw the Aburium nod in approval. A insect clone brought a subdued Akamaru out from behind Sasuke and Shino left via Shunshin. Sasuke picked up Kiba and Sakura carried Akamaru as Team 7 departed from the area never realizing they had some extra passengers with them. Hinata watched both teams struggle and ultimately fail, each diminished in their scuffles. She realized this would be the perfect opportunity to neutralize her competition before going for the scrolls. She had the beginnings of a plan but a crucial element depended on Ino. The Yamanaka had improved since the exams but this wasn't an easy task. Change in plans, both teams failed to obtain a scroll and are weakened. I say we take out the teams and then go after the scrolls ourselves. I'll take Yuzumaki-kun while you both go after Shikamaru. Why Shikamaru? And why would you go after Naruto alone? Asked Hino. Because Shikamaru-kun likely can't hold both of you and given his general laziness won't want an extended fight. Shino-kun is prepared had an easier fight than Yuzumaki-kun and will fight harder than Shikamaru-kun. I'll go alone because my skills match up to his and since he's already tired it'll be easy to defeat him. Hinata lied, believably. What's the plan? Asked Choji. Team 7 and 9 are on their way back. Shino-kun has hidden some of his kakechu on Team 7, likely to attack Team 9 though I have no idea how he'll direct them. When they do, I'll neutralize Team 9 while Ino will neutralize Sasuke-san with her jutsu. Knock out Sakura and then I'll do the same to Sasuke body. Sans, sounds like a good idea. Ino said with a smile and Choji agreed. Hinata waited for the two teams to get closer before giving them the signal but once she did the team moved silently until Hinata signaled they should stop. Team 10 watched the other teams watch each other warily but the respective leaders deduced neither managed to retrieve a scroll. The question was, who would go where next? If they were both going to the Nara, they'd have a fight on their hands anyway. If one time was going to wait while the other made a second attempt, they might as well try to take the other team out. Team 7 was a person down, and with Lee having been recently knocked out he wasn't at full capacity, but Team 9 had a distinct advantage. The stare down was intense, as Sasuke and Neji thought about what to do but each seemed to conclude a negotiation was needed as both approached each other. Inada activated her Byakugan to see what was being said amongst the two. She was not surprised when Sasuke agreed to allow Neji and company to go after the Nara in exchange for holding hostilities. Hinata smiled when the Kakechu, unnoticed by either slowly attached themselves to Neji. He felt the drain immediately and assumed it was the work of Sasuke. Hinata wasted no time and launched two poison senbin from her wrists, each one hitting Tenten and Lee. Since the paralytic was fast acting, both were down in seconds. Neji attempted to attack Sasuke but the constant drain of his chakra slowed him down and Sasuke easily slipped the finger jab, choosing to create some distance, but even he started to feel drained. It was happening faster than he could understand. His vision was starting to darken, consciousness fading fast. The last thing he saw was Neji hitting the ground before he followed suit. Hinata, taking full advantage of her fortunate circumstance fired another senbin at Sakura, hitting the distracted girl and knocking her out. What the hell, Hinata, that was not the plan. Ino yelled, indignantly. Somehow, Shino-kun planted his kakechu on Sasuke-san and set them up to attack Neji and Sasuke-san both. It might not be safe to get close to them, Ino-san. Besides, now, all you have to do is get the scroll from Shikamaru-san. Good luck, the heiress said before darting off toward her target, unsealing a metallic compound bow, and a quiver of arrows as she made her way through the path Team 9 took. She stopped to line up her shot. Naruto was sitting down, relaxed but not unaware. She pointed her bow, knocking her arrow. She held her breath for a moment and released it slowly just as she released the projectile. It tore through the sky, weaving carefully between the trees headed toward her intended target. At the last moment he rolled out of the way and the arrow struck a tree behind him. Hinata was already on the move and released three more arrows. He created an earth wall to intercept them. The Huuga era stayed in her new position, relieved she'd avoided any traps and couldn't use the arrow trajectories to guess her position. She knew his facility with shadow clones and wondered why he hadn't made any yet as it would be an ideal way to find her location. She didn't have much time to consider as she watched him blur through hand signs and slam his hand on the ground before a ceiling array appeared followed by chakra smoke. Oni Ai Chan, the sleepy panther asked. Hinata fought down the urge to go cuddle with the cute summons. Hi, I need your help, can you track the scent on these arrows? Hi, the cub answered and appeared to have obtained her scent. Hinata braced herself, moving too early or too late would put her in a bad position. 
What she was not prepared for was for the panther to merge with a shadow and disappear from her sight. Without delay, she decided movement was needed and narrowly avoided the swipe of a panther claw because of it. The panther cub was less cute now. Hinata decided active engagement. Up close and personal would be better than the hit and run tactics she'd utilized. She sped towards Naruto and took a swing at him with her bow, which he ducked. She followed up with a roundhouse. Naruto responded by dropping straight to the ground. Hinata had to jump in the air to avoid the panther again, twisting to not leave herself vulnerable. She was outflanked and knew it but wasn't going to give up. Hinata, having sealed her bow and arrows, sped toward Naruto again. She didn't fight in the traditional Hyuga manner, adopting sweeping motions instead of the jabs and thrusts the gentle fist is known for. She would often have to aim a strike at the cub to keep her honest but spent most of her time pressing Naruto. She went for a palm thrust, which he stopped and caught with both hands, one at the wrist and one at her elbow. Hinata was not deterred as she bent her middle and ring fingers down to pull at a trigger, unleashing more senbin from her hidden launcher. Naruto avoided them, barely, but decided he'd been on the defensive long enough. He let Hinata close the distance again but before she got into attack range she was ensconced in his chakra-infused hair while the cub jumped on her back. You give, he asked and the heiress nodded. Naruto undid the jutsu, face still neutral. So, you're an archer. Hinata nodded again. That is so cool. D-A-T-T-E-B-A-Y-O. How long have you been training? What can you do? How far can you shoot? What do your arrows do? Hinata would be a bit taken back by his abrupt change if she hadn't watched him for so long. Under orders. Let's see, since I was nine. I'm pretty accurate and can take shots most would think impossible due to obstructions. 53 meters. They are arrows, Yuzumaki kun they just do what arrows do. What about Fuinjutsu? Maybe some seals to add some additional features like flashbang or explosions or knockout gas or gloves. Gloves? Hinata asked with a quirked eyebrow. Yeah, like boxing gloves to act as a bludgeon. That doesn't sound very practical, Yuzumaki-kun. Naruto laughed before agreeing. I guess it doesn't. Sorry, my imagination gets away from me sometimes. Hinata giggles in response. That's fine. Almost none has shown as much enthusiasm for my interests as you just have. Thank you. Naruto rubs the back of his head bashfully. It's nothing. Besides, it's really cool. I was not expecting arrows. I do think some specialty arrows would really take things up a notch. Also, have you ever considered a Senban launcher that was chakra powered or had a seamless triggering mechanism? I have enough to know they don't exist. Why? They should. Naruto said and he took out an empty scroll, a brush and some ink and started writing and doodling furiously. Hinata sat beside the Yuzumaki and watched him work as he'd write down plans and cross them out only to write out some more. After several moments, it seemed he'd come to a stopping point. If you'd like, Hinata-san, I could experiment some and see what comes of it. I'd like that. Awesome, Titebeo. What would you want your arrows to do? Naruto asked and Hinata contemplated for a moment. His initial suggestions, excluding the boxing glove arrow, were good but surely she could come up with some herself. The two sat and chatted, trading ideas for the rest of the time until Kiranai showed up to signal time had elapsed. An hour later, apparently, Ino and Choji were not able to get a scroll either. The Jounin put their heads together, each having witnessed some part of the exercise. Guy was the most displeased with his team, seeing they allowed a personal issue to overwhelm their thinking. He also saw that his team was too linear and inflexible. The powdery substance that was on them, they they dismissed was a pheromone that caused Kikechu to become aggressive. Shibai used a similar tactic with his teammates, allowing them to bait enemies so he could attack them from far away. His team just assumed it did nothing or forgot about it entirely. Not good, especially if they would be fighting aim ninja. If he couldn't change or curb that he wouldn't allow them to participate in the aim assault. Kakashi was neither pleased nor displeased. His team operated as a unit, Sasuke had a sound plan but was simply outmaneuvered by the Aburame. He'd drill them on their tactics more as they've witnessed what a superior plan can net. Asuma was satisfied with most of his team's performance. Hinata was acting as a leader and had a good plan. She even knew when to change things to take advantage of the situation. The plan to have Choji and Ino take on Shikamaru together was solid but Choji's reluctance cost them in the end giving Shikamaru enough time to detain Ino, forcing Choji to submit. Shikamaru used a loophole in the rules and kept both members there longer so they couldn't go after Shino nor Naruto. Guy said Hinata put up a good fight against Naruto but being tagged team by his summons left her at a disadvantage she couldn't overcome. 
that was understandable. Training with Asanan was bound to net some positive results even if he hadn't been ahead of them to begin with. However, turning the last hour into a date was not what he expected of Hinata. Kiranai was downright smug. Her boys kicked ass and took names. She didn't even bother to hide it. They may not have been the strongest genin team but they were the best. Shikamaru and Shina were great at meticulous planning leading their enemies to the conclusions they wanted and their abilities had been tested to the max by Naruto. Why? Because he is a natural at counterplanning. If Shikamaru and Shina were elegant and precise, Naruto was like his namesake, a true maelstrom that would append anything with a split-second decision they couldn't account for. They influenced each other and helped each other grow. And since no one got a scroll she got to pocket $15,000 Ryo. It was good to be teammate. What is Naruto Uzumaki to you? Haruzen repeated the question Koharu just asked him. It was an odd question and it felt like a setup. What was Naruto to him? The obvious ones were Minato's son and Jinchiriki. Talented Chunin. Source of regret. Former surrogate grandchild. Once hope for the future. He didn't know what Koharu wanted with this question and it seemed his face gave away his confusion. While you were thinking did you list Clan Air? She asked neutrally. No. And let's say Anko's mission would have been a complete success. Let's say they even got married what would have happened? He would free of Orochimaru. Damn it, Haruzen, think. Don't obsess, don't react, think. And think he did as he was clearly missing a crucial piece of the puzzle until it hit him like a Raiden Jutsu. Clan Air, as in clan business. As in you planting a matriarch in the clan you pilfered funds from. Do you realize how bad that could have been if it were ever found out you were even planning on doing such a thing? Koharu questioned. I overlooked it entirely. I've really lost my edge, haven't I? Age will do that. I overlooked it as well. Tsunade pointed it out for me so at least I know she has the wits to sit in the chair. Haruzen, she's back. She's not going anywhere. If she had some grandiose plan maybe you could have unearthed it ten years ago but you won't now. All you're doing is making mistakes, mistakes that could damage the position of Hokage long after you leave it. Haruzen could only hang his head in shame, she was right about all of it. She has reason to hate me, and those reasons gave her the justification to become a monster. What if Naruto decides he gets to be a monster as well? They are different people, and if you don't want him to become a monster don't give him reason to act as one. Besides, I've read Inouich's reports. He'd leave before he'd take revenge. Our Hunternin would be most at risk. He has a team, he's making friends. Someone like him, he never needed much to tie him to the village. Haruzen didn't bother to respond, hoping his former teammate was right. After nearly being set up by the Sandame, Anko needed to be alone, and the one place she could ensure she'd be isolated was the Forest of Death. It felt good to cut loose when no one was watching, to mindlessly destroy things or just speed through the dense forest. It felt like home because it was a place that had no association with her former sensei. There was no taint, no one to judge, to glare at her in suspicion. She was free. So, as she making sport out of Samaro US, she was not pleased to see the one person she didn't want to see standing above, because she always stood above her. Was this it? Her sensei was finally going to end her. Why did she wait? To just make her suffer through years of ostracization. Why? Stop asking yourself so many questions when you don't have enough information to build any conclusions. You're just making yourself anxious and tense. If I were here to attack you, and I'm not, you've already given me an advantage. What do you want? To remove your seal. Orochimaru said plainly. That's not funny. Anko shouted. I'm not joking. If you aren't going to use it there's no point to it being there. Do you want it gone or not? Of course I do. What do you want in exchange? Why do this now? Nothing, I want nothing from you. As for why now, it's not important. It's important to me. You aren't altruistic. You don't just do things for people out of the goodness of your heart. I'm losing my patience with you, Anko-chan. Do you want the seal removed or do you not? I do. Good. Now, try not to scream too loudly, Orochimaru said before she blurred in front of Anko. The next thing Anko knew she was indeed screaming quite loudly until she blacked out from the pain. Orochimaru caught her first apprentice with a frown on her face, hoping Anko would be able to handle the effects of removing the seal. Her body felt heavy and every muscle felt like it was being pulled. Just the thought of moving hurt her. Even though her sheets were soaked through, she was cold and the splitting headache made her ears ring. None of those things were as scary as what she saw in her dreams. Anko hated her teacher more than anyone else for years. She hated everything about the woman, who was the personification of all that was bad in their world. Now that she remembered the last two years, she just wanted to kill herself. She was right there with her, participating in the experiments, torture, and wasting blood. 
Anko would do what her sensei told her to do if Orochimaru told her to burn down a village. It was that simple, and her obedience was so automatic, she didn't even have to think about it. Even when she had doubts or felt sick because of what she did, she tried to keep it from Orochimaru. Anko never wanted her to think that her apprentice couldn't keep up or didn't have the guts to do what was asked of her. Anko finally broke down, though, when she was asked to get a small child ready for an experiment. She turned into a trembling mass and found it hard to say sorry between sobs. Orochimaru gave the girl a smile and a pat on the head, telling her she didn't have to do it. The next day, Anko got the cursed mark, and she forgot everything until Akanoha strike team found her a while later. She didn't like herself, didn't like what she did, didn't like why she did it. Part of her even hated that her loyalty wasn't appreciated and was instead seen as a flaw. She did everything she could to make that woman happy, but she didn't care. Anko turned into a monster for a monster, and because of that, he was left alone. It was sad how much it hurt to realize that everything was for nothing. That Orochimaru liked the red-haired Yuzumaki, who was so different from her, but didn't like Anko. It was a sad joke, and she was a sad joke, too. It was the perfect mixture of tragedy and comedy. Not smart enough to be one of her students. Not low enough to be one of her followers. Not even worth dying for. Just a toy that Orochimaru got bored with and left behind. Despite how upset she was, she was aware that, she thought, someone was in her apartment. She was in so much pain that she didn't care. She also knew who it was and wanted to give the mean girl more time to feel good about herself. Anko-chan, how much longer are you going to act like you're asleep? I'd hope you'd leave if I left, Anko said, forcing herself to sit up straight against her headboard. The dark purple sheets on her bed, a metal and glass topped nightstand to her left, and a chest of drawers on the right wall made up her bedroom. Orochimaru was sitting at the end of her bed, watching her old student closely. So, is this your last joke? Let me hate you for years and then show me to be just like you. Anko snapped at the woman, who had been looking at her too closely for too long. If you've gotten your memories back, you know you're not like me. You were just a little girl trying to please her sensei. I did those things anyway, no matter why. I'm no better than you, and these people had good reason to hate and reject me. They knew what I was. Orochimaru said, if that's who you are, you'd still do those things, but you don't. You didn't change into me, so in that way you beat me. She saw that she had used Anko's admiration in the same way that Haruzen had used hers. It was one of the few things that really made her feel bad. Anko asked, what do you mean? Because he didn't know what the Sanin meant. Let's just say there's more to Haruzen Sarutobai than you know, and not everything about him is good. Anko wanted to argue, but she was in too much pain to argue about something that didn't need to be argued about. Why did you open the package? Because I want to make things right, Anko, she said. The violet-haired woman didn't seem to believe her. I've been told to apologize, and I agree. You've gone as far as you can with hating me as motivation. You may never forgive me, but since I'm not going anywhere, I hope you can move on. Anko snorted, then made a painful face. Even though she hated the she-demon, she was smart enough to admit that it was right. She wasn't getting better, and in terms of skill, she wasn't any closer to killing her old sensei than she was to growing wings and making wishes come true. She hadn't never thought about just moving on with her life, but an ache of unfairness and unresolved scores kept her from doing so. I can't promise anything. I've hated everything about you for so long, but what you did seems to have helped me stop hating myself. Be grateful for the little things. I wish this pain would go away. Did it have to hurt this much? Yes. Besides you're strong, you'll manage. Your bedside manner sucks. Hyukuku. Orochimaru left soon after. No matter what Anko and her relationship turned out to be, it would take time, and she doubted it would ever be anything more than resigned acceptance. She could be okay with that, and Koharu couldn't say that she hadn't tried. When the woman thought that, she got very, very upset. The snake Sanin chose to walk through the village. It was still quite early, the sun just peeking about the horizon. People weren't out in large numbers, and those who were seemed to have mixed feelings about how to treat her. She could see that they were scared, but she could also see that they felt a little safer because the legendary three had come back. If only they knew, she would never go out of her way to save even one of them. Konoha had what she wanted, and the best way for her to reach her goals was for it to stay standing. If that ever changed, she would set this place on fire, and not give a second thought to the people who were hurting. When she saw that someone was following her, she shook her head. As she got closer to the last street before her house, the tag along finally showed up. A chunin, judging by the vest and the silvery hair that comes to the chin. The main character looked familiar, but she couldn't place her. Orochimaru-sama, could we talk for a moment? The man asked, and what can I do for you today, chunin-kun? She asked. The man turned red and made a small sneer at the question. Most people would say he got better quickly, 
but to her experienced eyes, he might as well have shouted how he felt. Mizuki Orochimaru-sama. Oh, she thought. It was the Chunin fuck-up who couldn't even do what she told Hinata to do when she was a third of Hinata's age. It was a simple observe and report because she wanted more information on the Yuzumaki heir. She knew he'd be easy to control because his insecurities were on full display. He was jealous, frustrated, and self-centered. How could I forget, Mizuki-kun? How many I help you today? Well, your agent said that if I helped you, I'd get access to a lot of power one day. Orochimaru had to hold back a sigh. This boring man was taking up time she could be spending with Naruto-kun. He wasn't boring. Even when he was just sitting and reading, she could feel the ideas racing through his head and the excitement he felt when he thought of something new or figured out how to do something better. She wondered if she just killed this Chunin, how many people would miss him. It would be faster than this conversation. She put on a smile, which was a great example of how to show feelings you definitely didn't have, since she was just bored with what was in front of her. Hyukuku, I remember telling you to watch out for a certain student. I heard from my other agents that you were careless, withholding instruction and doing other things to sabotage his education in a subtle way. I was just thinking. Hyukuku, I didn't tell you to think, I just told you to obey. How can I thank you if you might mess up my plans? You failed and it was due to factors outside of that pathetic academy you didn't cause any real damage. But he's the Q you buy. He nearly shouted. She actually had to blink at that. Did this fool actually believe he was the Q you buy? Not even civilians believed he was the actual Q you buy. This conversation just got too stupid for her to devote any further attention to. That's stupid. And even if he were, I told you to keep track of his movements and tell me about them. You didn't do it, so you don't get anything, she said, and this time Mizuki didn't even try to hide her sneer. I know stuff. I can tell Sandame sama how you gave me a cursed seal and told me to keep an eye on the Kyuubai brat. Hyukuku, I'll tell him that I gave it to you after you choked a friend to death. I won't get hurt, but you will be killed, which would save me from having to do it myself. So please, Mizuki-kun, go tell on him. She didn't say anything else, so she just walked away. The Chunin instructor stood there in silence, furious at being told to go away, and not getting what he was owed. He promised he'd get her back one of these days. Orochimaru went back to her house, knowing that Chunin was probably making plans for revenge. She decided to let him try, if only to keep herself from getting bored. When she got back, she wasn't surprised to see her student out back. He was wearing a red shirt with a white spiral on the back and black pants and sandals to match. He was surrounded by ten shadow clones, each writing or drawing ideas. She could see the sweat on his forehead as he held his hands in the ram sign and breathed slowly. When one of his clones yelled, Boss, to get his attention, which made the condensed water fall on his head and soak him. The offending clone vanished right away, probably because he liked that better than a more forceful option. Stupid clone. Stupid nidam. A stupid trick with water. It couldn't have just been that they liked water. Strength of affinities might not even exist outside of primary and secondary school, T. Tebeo. Naruto had been trying to copy the Nidame's way of controlling water for a while. He had gotten to the point where he could feel the water in the air, and even draw some of it to him to shape. It was hard work, and the amount of water he got for the amount of chakra he used was very bad. The science isn't settled on if primary affinities are stronger or weaker in cross comparisons, boss. If they aren't, it may mean that other parts of the chakra are being measured and not the strength of the affinity. One of the clones said, chakra paper may just be a significance test that shows which elements a person's chakra is drawn to, but the strength of the reaction may not mean much, even more so if the chakra isn't trained. If someone can use Futen Jutsu, then the reason they might not be able to use a certain level of that Jutsu isn't because of how strong their affinity is. You can't do s rank Jutsu if you're good with wind but only have the strength of a Genin. Reserves and capacity take precedence over it. Some people have inclinations toward various aspects of chakra, boss, not just elemental affinities. We just don't test for them in any rationalized way. People who have trouble with ninjutsu say they are more of a Jinjutsu type. You're right, T. Tebeo. The Nidame didn't have a stronger affinity for water. The idea makes no sense. What do you think about it? If we say it's because of how he used it in battle, we're not doing things the right way. The reason is circular, because we know the Nidame had a strong affinity for water because he did. Outside of his method of taking water from the atmosphere why else is he said to have such a strong affinity? Another clone said, he could do the water dragon jutsu with just one hand seal. Yes, but a lot of what makes the jutsu hard is that you have to change shapes. We've managed to half the required hand seals after we learned the racing gun. 
another clone added. That's true. It's one of the reason Daten Jutsu tend to have fewer hand seals. The element is inherently more stable. Creating a shape out of it is just more straightforward, said an additional clone. Guys, let's not get too far ahead of ourselves. Let's start from the beginning. What are the parts that make up Jutsu? The original asked. Nature and form, all the clones said together. But not just that. One clone said after a moment. What are you saying? Yes, nature and shape are to blame. That holds true for ninjutsu and jinjutsu but they aren't the same. And learning the Rasengan didn't just make the water dragon easier. Our jinjutsu also got a little easier to use. That could just be due to an increase in chakra control said one of the shadow clones. Yes, but at that time we were learning more than just the Rasengan. What would the Edo Tensai have? No, it wouldn't. It's what we used to do. Yin and Yang. Original Naruto responded with a glint of understanding. We were able to feel, at least a little better the balance of Yin and Yang in our Jutsu. Ninjutsu tends to favor Yang. Jinjutsu Jutsu tends to favor Yin. Ario Ninjutsu is likely the most balanced of the two. Perhaps perhaps that's how. He somehow could use higher concentrations of Yang Chakra in his suit and Ninjutsu, and it improved the conversion rate, making it possible to do high-level Jutsu with the water molecules around him. Naruto finished only to hear clapping coming from behind him. The clones turned as well, none realizing they had an audience, too focused on their discussion. They collectively rubbed the back of their heads, sheepishly. Hi, Shishu they said and she laughed. Good morning, Naruto Kuns. She said, it looks like we're making some progress this morning, which made everyone smile. Some people say that the shot I was able to use the Mokutan not just because he was good at Dotan and Sutan, but also because he had a lot of Yang Chakra. Some people call it the life element. She thought her student's look of utter amazement was so cute. Naruto quickly made a young style shadow clone and had it try to pull water out of the air. It got splashed right away and started yelling at the same time. I'm sorry if I'm in the way. No, that's not it. Before I got in the way, they were actually working on something else. What are they working on? I might be able to help. Oh, we met Hyuga Hinata-san yesterday, and she's an archer as far as we can tell. That's so cool. Orochimaru said, yes, that's pretty cool, but he didn't sound very excited. Naruto didn't seem to notice, but she doesn't use any fancy arrows. She seemed confused when I asked what they could do. So, we went to dinner last night and exchanged some ideas. And just having my clones look over some ceiling arrays. Leave it to an Uzumaki to turn to Fuinjutsu, I suppose. What are some of your ideas? Well, one was a knockout arrow, but instead of poison or an electric shock, I was trying to turn my ninja art, chirp into an array. I didn't know you'd gotten it down enough to try that, Orochimaru said with a raised eyebrow. She'd heard Naruto complain several times about his supersonic chakra technique being hard to turn into a jutsu. The only one he'd managed was a high-pitched sound that knocked out the target. Last night, I had some clones working on it to make it perfect, so I finally have the control I need. Good job, she told him as she gently stroked his cheek. He let out a very low purr. That never happened, Titebeo. The rookie chunin exclaimed in embarrassment. We'll see, but I won't promise anything. After that, there was talk of arrows that blew up. Arrows were slick with lightning and wind. Arrows that had sound dampening seals on them so they wouldn't alert the intended target. And even arrows that released a poison fog but I ran into a complication with that. What's the problem? Well, I don't know what kind of poison comes out of the poison mist jutsu. That made me wonder if it could be changed to make different kinds of poison. Since it's more of a gas anyway, can we make a jutsu that makes it act like other gases? Imagine that your target is in a room that is locked and doesn't have good ventilation. So you fill the room with a lot of carbon monoxide. One that goes away quickly. Hum, that is a very good idea. Orochimaru said, I might have to do some experiments myself. I can't let my rival get ahead of me so easily. Huh? Naruto asked, tilting his head to the right and squinting. You didn't think I'd simply allow you to be known as Konoha's greatest jutsu creator without some competition, did you? I like this idea, though. I'll try to figure out how that jutsu works and we'll go from there. I think you should work on your water control. Any particular reason, Shishu? To stick it to Haruzen, of course. My student, who loved his sensei very much, tried to do one of his best things. Even the professor hasn't been able to do this. Oh, turning that knife will be MMMH. I can't even put it into words. Naruto didn't know what to say, so he went back to work. Shizune was surprised to see Genma Shirinui and Reido Namiashi in the Hokage's office with her. She bowed to the Hokage and waited for mission details since the summons wasn't very clear. She still went home and put on her jounin uniform instead of the kimono she usually wore when she wasn't on a mission. 
Thank you, Shizun Chan, for getting here so quickly. As one of the two people who knows about and is immune to the effects of the Ishvali iris, I thought it was time to send you to start making both an immunization and a version that can be used as a weapon. Genma and Rado will be there on a separate issue so once a sample cure and poison are created you may return. Of course making sure to give Genma and Rado their shots. If you don't have any questions and remember what I told you, you're free to go. The three Jounin left and went to the gate. Shizun could tell that her two temporary squad mates, Genma and Rado, were nervous so she decided to ask them what was wrong. A lot, said the special Jounin, who was chewing Senbin. When he realized that didn't answer anything, he turned on a genjutsu that distorted sounds and said, Not everyone in this village is blind, Shizun. Those of us who weren't were told not to go near the child. Shizun didn't show any reaction because she thought Jureya had heard the same thing. Instead, she just waited for them to keep talking. Sandame Sama was quite strict in his enforcement of that. We disliked it greatly, Kakashi detested it with his entire being. There were times when we were afraid he would do something stupid and kill himself, Rado said. Even more so when he wasn't allowed to train with the Gaki. A lot of trees had a lot of Chidori-shaped holes through them. Genma added, There wasn't a lot we could do for him, not directly but we did watch out for him. Made sure that no one ever tried to hurt him or cheat him, Rado said. The few times he had to go to the hospital, we made sure he was treated fairly. They were always professional, and some were even more than that. Shizun looked worried, but Rado said, They were always professional, and some were even more than that. Genma continued, Anyway, we couldn't have him as a student, couldn't even run missions with him as Sandame Sama wouldn't allow it. But we did keep an eye on his reports from the mission, to check on how he was doing and make sure none of the Chunin were putting his life at risk or trying to slow him down. When Kakashi got back from Ishval, he read the report first. He then went straight to Sandame Sama and asked for an Arank assassination mission that he would pay for himself. We were glad the Gaki made it, but we knew that being the only one to make it would be hard on him. And it did. He didn't feel like himself again until he joined Kuranai's team, which took a few months. Sorry, I got off track. We'd have gone with Kakashi no problem but the sand name refused. Said the leader of Ishval, Akiro Kurosawa, was now indebted to Konoha. That he was worth more alive than dead. We don't share that opinion. Not only did he lie to get that team there, he got three ninja killed because the greedy little bastard thought he could control two Kiri swordsmen. Rado said, before you got there, he was telling us not to make any hasty decisions and that if anything happened to the bastard, he would hold us responsible. So, what do you want to do? Asked Shizun, frowning at the thought of the man who almost killed her surrogate brother. She remembered how broken Naruto looked after he was cured. At first, only Taunton could get him to smile, but he did eventually open up, though not as much as he did when he was with them. She understood why they wanted to hurt that man. Genma said, we're to bring Akiro back here. That's all we know. When the three of them got to the gate, they checked out and then flew very fast toward Ishval. Kakashi went to the manor with his signature book in hand. He didn't expect a very warm welcome, but even that didn't prepare him for what he got. Who are you, you idiot? Ma, Ma, Yuzumaki-chan. That's not very nice. I am Hattie Kakashi and I'm here to see Naruto about a mission. Oh, well come in, he's out back talking to him. She said as she led him to the back. Kakashi had to admit that the house lacked much of what one would expect in the home of an evil scientist bent on world domination, or whatever her aims are. He really couldn't be asked to care, honestly. The large complex did seem comfortable, almost homey. It was weird, like finding out the Kyuubai really liked the snuggle. Teuya, who is this? Another Yuzumaki asked, Karin Kakashi guessed, based on the titles of some medical books she was carrying. This is Dickhead, and he's here for a stump. Karin just rolled her eyes, Teuya had to have respect beaten into her. It wasn't one of her better qualities. Karin turned toward the Jounin and introduced herself and he did so in kind as the trio made it to the back to see Naruto, and several clones having a furious discussion. Oi, stump. Teuya shouted and did well to get out of the way of the kunai aimed at her head. Overreact much, asshole. She responded, only to get flipped off as Naruto walked over to the group. Karin sighed. Her cousins were strange. Sorry, Hadeik-san, Teuya isn't house-trained yet, she said, only to get a one-finger salute in return. Naruto said, hey, guys, and ignored Teuya's complaints. Hello, Naru-chan, you free for a quick, in-village C-rank mission? Sure, Kurenai-sensei let us train on our own for the day. What do you need me to do? Come with me, I'll explain on the way, he said and the two departed. Teuya, why are you so mean to Naruto? He cares a lot about how tall he is, because it makes me laugh. Besides, Tsunade-sama said to gently raz him when she's not around. 
Why do you call her Tsunade-sama? Why is Teuya being so nice to Orochimaru-sama? Asked Karin, who was confused. Eh, I don't want to talk about it. Teuya said, color drained from her face. The two arrived to training ground three and Naruto saw the familiar smoke of a dispelled shadow clone. Why Kakashi didn't send a clone to get him? He could not imagine and apparently it was a question shared by his team. Why did you leave a clone with us, Sensei? Sakura yelled. Naruto didn't remember her being that loud, so he wondered when it happened. Ma, ma, I just like him more is all. No big deal. Kakashi responded while his students and an Inuzuka puppy face faulted into the ground. Kiba said, you're too honest, sensei, way too honest. Don't ask questions you don't want the answers to. Think of this as a lesson for your life. Now, today, Sakur, Kiba and Akamaru you'll be with me. The team was entirely too straightforward in your approach to yesterday's drill. That kind of behavior is dangerous so we'll be doing some exercises to expand your creativity and tactics. What about Sasuke-kun? Naruto will teach him ninjutsu here, they said, and Sasuke looked both interested and confused. You're the copy ninja, why can't you teach me ninjutsu? Sasuke, that's a great question. See, as your Jounin sensei, I teach you what I think you need to know to survive, not what you want to know. If you want additional lessons then we have other resources. Naruto here has paid for multiple C-rank missions to receive private lessons from one of the village's experts. Didn't help him much with his rating, though, Kakashi said, smiling at Naruto as he finished. Oi, when you get some free time I want to spar. I'll show you a Raiten Jutsu, Titebao. I'm excited about it. Now, Kiba, Sakura with me. You two, have fun. Naruto waited for the other members of Team 7 to depart before he spoke to Sasuke. Is there a body of water near here? We'll be focusing on Katen. Sasuke nodded and started to walk in the direction of a pond. Why Katen? My primary is Raiten and word has it you can use every element. Word has it. Tapped into the rumor mill, Sasuke-san. My Konoichi teammate is. It's 99% annoying but this once was approaching useful. You also didn't answer my question. Oh, that's simple. Kakashi paid for the lesson and requested I focus on your fire jutsu. Also, given what I'll be teaching you, it works better if you have a few jutsu known already. Aren't you teaching me jutsu? Sasuke asked in confusion. No. Well, maybe. Kakashi left that up to my discretion. Then what is the point of this? Naruto could hear the annoyance in his voice and sighed a little. A solo C rank isn't bad money but he wished Sasuke could just be a little patient. There's a difference between giving you a recipe and teaching you how to cook, Sasuke said, looking confused. If I teach you the individual skills that go into cooking then you can do a lot more. Naruto's metaphor wasn't helping. Okay, let's try a different track. I can draw my sword from the side or overhead from my back. Perfectly. It never catches, it is always smooth. Does that make me a master swordsman? No, of course not. Then why is it if someone can execute a single jutsu in a similar fashion repeatedly are they a master of that jutsu? I never really thought about it. Almost no one does. I'm not going to just teach you a jutsu. I'm going to teach you an approach to jutsu so you get more out of them. One jutsu that can do three things is better than three jutsu that do one thing. Naruto said as the pair reached the pond. Now, I understand you favor the great fireball jutsu. Right. Sasuke nodded so he continued. How many people have you managed to actually hit with it? Not many, Sasuke admitted, reluctantly. Understandable. It's powerful for a C-rank jutsu but unless the enemy is immobile it can be avoided. It's also pretty centralized. But what if it weren't? What do you mean? Activate your sharing and then watch. Sasuke did just that and watched as Naruto went through the familiar hand seals. Naruto inhaled deeply but when he started to exhale the shape of his mouth was different. His lips were slightly closed at the middle and the fire jutsu split, sending two medium-sized fireballs, one to the left and one to the right. Naruto said, that's just a simple change, but Sasuke smiled in satisfaction. Naruto didn't know why, but he wanted to call the last Uchiha a jerk, but he didn't. What neither boy knew was that there was a third person watching them with a small smile hidden behind his ANBU mask. How does one forgive themselves? Is it a feeling? A place you'll only know you've reached once you've managed it. Or is it a choice? One you make once or multiple times. Here and I didn't know this, didn't have the clearest explanation for it so she felt like a fraud when she advised Anko to do just that, to forgive herself. Ninja live with guilt, almost all have done something they could and potentially should feel guilty about. Many hide the guilt behind quirky behavior or patriotic zeal. Some are nindo. Others just simply numb themselves but the guilt is there, even with the skewed morals they adopt. No one process is truly superior to another and what triggers that sense is as wide-ranging as the personalities of the ninja in Kano has forces. But guilt is a singularly limiting emotion. 
where other emotions can be put to good use, even anger and rage can be beneficial. Guilt is limiting. It isn't a sign you've learned a lesson. It's a process of continuing to obsess, harp on a wrong you've done. It can make you slower, depressed, or sloppy. No one had to look further than Kakashi to see what guilt could do. Someone that should clearly be cage level is only really getting back to seriously training himself. Sure and I didn't want Anko to waste away, even though her hatred for Orochimaru did push her to try to get better. This could cause her to go backwards, and since she might be in the front lines in a few months, there wasn't time for that. Anko had to give herself permission to move on. Kiranai was thankful her friend could acknowledge the logic of her words but it was clear this would be a struggle. No one wants to admit they are similar to the person they hate most in the world as you don't want to empathize with him. It's easier if they are simple, monstrous individuals. Complexity gets in the way and thanks to her student, she'd been getting a more and more complicated view of the once traitor and the current Hokage. She still thought Orochimaru was a monster, but in the way humans can be. The distance between her and anyone else a matter of degrees, not type. And the Sandame wasn't the kind, wisened leader she once thought. He was still those things but also someone that loved his own lore and the glory that came with the title. Someone who could have potentially preyed upon her if circumstances had been different only to throw her away when she became inconvenient, no longer needed for his ego. As the pictures of these people became more and more complicated, she only wished people she cared about weren't caught in the middle. Anko, and Naruto most specifically but Asuma as well. He knew Orochimaru was manipulating him. She simply wagered the reveal of the affair would outweigh that concern. Now, Asuma's relationship with the Sandame was in tatters, all the progress they made completely undone. Anko was slipping into an emotional black hole, and Naruto. She didn't even know except he hated the Sandame and respected the Sanin, relying on her to get him through the upcoming trials. Nothing about this was right, nothing about it set well but the Jinjutsu mistress felt powerless to influence, let alone control any of it. She was out of her depths, getting stronger but not strong enough to ensure Naruto could face down multiple S-rank opponents. Smart but not informed enough to navigate the plots and plans Orochimaru seemed to craft with great efficacy. But what she could do is be there, offer comfort to Anko, a sounding board to Asuma, and a way to keep Naruto connected to his teammates and possibly the village at large. She wouldn't let him be isolated just in case Orochimaru was manipulating him. It wasn't much but she'd make the best of it. So wrapped up in her thoughts she didn't notice Anko drift off on her shoulder as the two sat in the special Jounin's bed, exhaustion finally taking her. Kira and I felt her resolve harden. She'd be here for those she cared about and she didn't need to be a legend to do it. That's enough for today, Sasuke-san. Don't want you slipping into chakra exhaustion, Naruto said. The Uchiha had done well with finding different ways to perform his jutsu but he could only get so far until he's done the manipulation exercises. Still, there was progress and Naruto had performed his assigned duties. Honest days work for honest days pay. You know a lot about chakra exhaustion, right? I've never experienced it. I think I hate you a little, Sasuke admitted. Near endless chakra would be a dream come true. Yay, it's sunshine and roses. You'd cry if you had to invest as much time into chakra control as I have and still do. I don't cry. Big, sloppy, bitch boy tears. Every day. I don't know. But I think he'd do a single tear to be extra dramatic and deep, said Kakashi as he walked toward the two of them. Sasuke scowled, but it wasn't a very angry look. I feel like crying because a Chunin is a better teacher than my Jounin sensei. Just because Naruto works for cheap doesn't mean I don't understand my own value, Sasuke-chan. Naruto said with a sweat drop, I think he just insulted us both. I did. I must have done something wrong in a past life to deserve you, Kakashi. If only Sasuke knew. Ma, ma, I'm one of the strongest Jounin in the village. You're lucky to have me. Who else would pay a genius to teach you something in his field? Naruto said, I'm not a prodigy, Titebeo. Two faces gave him the really. Look, what? I'm not. And the last person to call me that got his ass kicked, so beware. Well, it looks like you're done for the day, so you can go, Sasuke. Naruto, you can get your pay at any time from the mission office. If you're free, I'll give you that spar you wanted. Naruto answered, my schedule is open, and he didn't try to hide how excited he was. The chance to test himself against a well-known Jounin who was also his dad's student was a great chance, and it would also be a good test. Can I stay and watch? Sure but no sharing in. Lifting Jutsu off me is one thing but Naruto's fall under clan techniques. Sasuke nodded not even bothered by the stipulation. Spending a few hours with the redhead he saw how much thought went into common Jutsu. He wouldn't steal his work, it just wouldn't sit right. Sasuke saw Kakashi put his book away, which meant he was taking Naruto pretty seriously. Both fighters looked calm and ready to wait for a sign. 
Suddenly, Naruto rushed at Kakashi with a sweep kick to the copy ninja's left. Kakashi just lifted his leg. Naruto finished his rotation and quickly jumped up to hit Kakashi in the stomach. Kakashi slapped the strike away while backing up. While still on his back foot, Kakashi sent out a swift jab. Naruto narrowly dodged it and grabbed the offending arm. Kakashi had no interest in whatever the Uzumaki was planning and pushed him back with a front kick. Naruto sent several shuriken toward him in response, halting Kakashi's plan to press his advantage. Naruto dashed forward again. This time he sent a high kick towards Kakashi's right side but it was easily blocked. A second kick from the same foot followed the block and Kakashi guarded against the kick strike. Naruto tried for a third attempt, having never planted his foot after the first kick but this time he pulled the leg back slight to perform a standing side kick. The maneuver caught Kakashi off guard enough to clip him on his hip, but he was a veteran for a reason. Kakashi rolled with the strike and sent a left cross toward Naruto. The speed and distance were such that Naruto didn't have time to dodge, so he took the hit. Kakashi watched as his head snapped back and the redhead fell to the ground, out cold. Kakashi smiled as he watched Naruto from a tree branch. He thought that Naruto put a very subtle genjutsu on him when he grabbed Kakashi's arm. Naruto made the ram seal, which caused the wall to fall, and then went back to attacking Kakashi. He jumped and kicked Kakashi, who raised his right arm to block. Naruto brought up his other foot, but Kakashi ducked it, raising his arm when the foot passed his head and kicking Naruto away. Naruto rolled into a skid but had to quickly defend himself against Kakashi's attacks, ducking and dodging when he could. And here I thought I'd have to tell you not to use that against a fellow soldier. To have the chakra to waste on using the Rasengan as a feint, it must be nice. It has its advantages. For instance, Naruto didn't finish, instead speedily performed a series of hand seals and thought wind style, gale bullets. The technique, similar to wind bullets in that compressed air is formed into a shell. However, the shell isn't as stable and this jutsu doesn't have the piercing power. In exchange, when the constructs meet resistance they unleash the stored wind chakra and a high amount of concussive force. Kakashi just thought it was the wind bullet and dodged it, but the gale force winds threw him into the water. He used the water style, water dragon jutsu as soon as he landed, which made Naruto put up another mud wall. From behind the wall came three clones of Naruto, each moving at top speed to attack Kakashi. The Jounin led the charge, fighting off the clones but keeping an eye on where the real Naruto was. He almost made it, but Naruto finished the seal chain in time, and Kakashi's charge was stopped by a tentacle grabbing his left ankle. Soon, three more tentacles grabbed a limb each, and before Kakashi knew it, he was pulled under the water. That was Naruto's strongest suit in jutsu, water style, released the Kraken jutsu. Kakashi was both impressed and amused by the large, mythical, yellow-eyed squid that was pulling him toward the bottom of the lake. It was quite scary and was squeezing Kakashi hard as it tried to get him to drink water. Naruto was giving him a good workout, but if he let this go on for too long, the Uzumaki might get the wrong idea. Really, using the Sharingan against a Chunin. Naruto asked, and Kakashi just shrugged, not even trying to hide the fact that he was overreacting. Naruto braced himself, knowing that things were about to get a lot harder. This is so embarrassing. Naruto grumbled from the back of Kakashi. He'd been correct. Things did become more difficult in that almost everything he tried was neutralized or countered and he got his ass handed to him. Admittedly, not that surprising as Orochimaru does it constantly as well but at least she leaves him his dignity. And he was too tired to even fight him on it. I couldn't just leave you out in the field. I might have preferred it. Besides, didn't you go a little hard on me? You could handle it. Clearly, I didn't push you hard enough if you didn't use any fuin or kenjutsu. Besides, you needed to learn that the little brother can't beat the big brother. Law of nature. Well, thanks for that Nyai-sama, Naruto said with an eye roll. Listen, Naruto. I know that the old man told you not to come near me. Juriya said as much. I don't blame you or anything. Thank you, but I could have done more. There's no point in thinking about it now, and besides, I'm still here. But if you're just going to beat me up and make me give you rides, Titabeo, I might have to leave. Well, it's lucky for me I'm quite the gifted tracker, Kekashi said before knocking on the door. They didn't have to wait long for the exact last person Naruto wanted to see him like this. Hyukuku, long day. Naruto had never felt so lame. We had a fight, and all I did was push him a little harder. He could use a hand. No, I don't, just put me down. He'd crawl, roll or do the freaking worm but he was not letting Orochimaru carry him. Unfortunately, his body couldn't obey his command to protest vehemently, and he found himself in the Sanin's grasp. He had a new appreciation for how sacks of potatoes felt. I thank you, Kakashi. No problem. 
Naruto, I'll be in touch. Kakashi couldn't hear what he said, but it sounded a lot like Duck Trader. As a good older brother should, he left Naruto to deal with his shame. Orochimaru walked through the door, ignoring Naruto's assurances that he could walk. If he could move he'd have done so but Kakashi had managed to push him near physical exhaustion. Impressive given his stamina but Kakashi's years of experience would aid in negating that advantage. As she made her way to Naruto's temporary room, he finally said something that made her pay attention. Shishu, are you okay? I'm fine, why do you ask? Something seemed to be bothering you this morning but I didn't want to pry. That surprised her as he hadn't let on he suspected anything. Seeing no reason to lie she responded. Last night, I broke Anko's cursed seal and stayed with her. It was Koharu's idea to try to make up for something. I don't know what will come of it. Oh, well, maybe it'll work out and you'll be able to get along. I can understand your hope, but I don't believe it. Could you let Sensei go? I'm not sure. When I think about everything he's done, I can understand a lot of it. But his refusal to trust me hurt the most. If he'd explained everything we could have worked something out but he chose not to and when things started changing between us, when the things that should have earned his acknowledgement were essentially ignored I had no way to understand it. I wondered if it was my fault or if he never really cared and that's when I started to hate him. The hiding my lineage, the taking from my inheritance were betrayals but it only added to what I was already feeling. Could he make things right? I can't say. If he had admitted to everything before he was forced to, and if he hadn't done things to try to save face, like telling the ninja forces that the Yuzumaki swirl was taken off because the clan was becoming official in the village, then maybe. But he still cares too much about his own power and fame. I think he's sorry, but it wasn't enough to make him change, and anything he does now is tainted. On the other hand, I know what's like for people to hold something against me with no way to make it up. Even if I didn't know what I had done so I wouldn't rule out ever forgiving him in the future but I'm not there yet. Interesting. If that's the case, I wouldn't have much hope for Anko. Because I don't think she's as forgiving as you and I were when we did something similar. Maybe, maybe not. But sometimes it only takes a really small gesture, Naruto said. He was glad Orochimaru didn't do anything weird like try to tuck him in, even though she did seem lost in her thoughts. He meant what he said, as angry as he was with the old man, because he knows how heavy the weight of wanting to be forgiven can be. It took Bagheera a long time to convince him he didn't deserve it, but Orochimaru had thought about Naruto's words. She very rarely cared about who she'd wronged in her life but Anko was an exception, especially when she realized how she was mimicking her own sensei. The curse seal was supposed to help her, make her stronger while taking away her memories so she couldn't be held responsible for anything she was ordered to do. That didn't pan out but maybe there was something she could do for her former student once the aim invasion was over and the Akatsuki were gone. One small gesture. What could it hurt? Three heiresses walked through a part of the village away from the clan district. This wouldn't be very interesting on its own. But the fact that all three were going to the apartment building of the Kyuubai container makes it interesting. People paid attention to that, but none of the three girls did the same. Hinata, Hanabi, and Ino were on their way to Naruto's rooftop garden, which he had been growing since he started at the Shinobi Academy. His team was given an undetermined length mission, and some of his plants were in a very fragile state. He then gave her a seal tag and told her that it would let her into both his garden and his apartment, which were both sealed off. Hinata agreed, but even with his clear instructions, she didn't know much about gardening, so she asked her teammate for help. She was surprised that Yamanaka joined in so quickly, but then she realized she could do a little snooping and find out some gossip. She might have gotten better or at least less obvious, but Ino was still Ino. She didn't think that the thing that drove the mind jutsu expert crazy would be the presence of high-quality volcanic ash, which is a luxury that every good gardener values. Hinata thought it was because of his lava jutsu, but she would never tell anyone, not even when he told her. Because of a deal she made when she was four, it would be hard to explain why she was watching him to see if he was an S-rank traitor. Also, it was one of her favorite memories to see him light up so brightly that he could have been mistaken for the sun after seeing something that everyone thought was impossible. How it was even more impressive because he tried to do it so many times and failed. But he kept going even though he had doubts. It gave her enough motivation to keep going with her own plans. People would probably call her a traitor and a coward if they knew, but she didn't care. She would not live her life the way other people thought she should. But that didn't mean she wouldn't take care of her duties. She wanted to make sure that her little sister wouldn't be a slave to the old Hyuga clan doctrine. That she wouldn't just follow the Hyuga way because that's what everyone else did. No, Hanabi wouldn't be proud and snobbish like many members of her clan. In fact, many branch members look down on people who didn't live in Hyuga. They say that the clan's traditions are what keep it strong. But the clan has grown stronger under Kanoha's care. 
Even though the clan was important, it was the Senju and the Uchiha who changed the way Shinobi lived. But the Hyuga would never say that, and they would never tell the truth about their pasts. During the warring era, their way was the same as every other clan's, have a lot of kids and hope for the best. Strict traditions would be used against you and lead to your death. Even if nothing else, she would be grateful to Orochimaru for giving her different versions of the past and different ways to do many things. Even if she was told to give up the fight against Neji, it wouldn't have mattered because she was sure of her strength and her goal. She'd just have to give that strength to Hanabi so that she wouldn't fall for hagiographies, lies, or the gentle fist cult. If she was lucky, it would be the lasting result of her rebellion. And like a real shinobi, no one would ever know that she was the one who planned it. Hinata helped Hanabi jump to the roof, and the three girls went into the garden. Even though there wasn't much room, the plants were beautiful, with different colors all over. It was quiet, but it felt almost wild, like it was on the edge of chaos. It was a good match for the spiraling maelstrom that made it. The three of them got to work, watering, pruning, and even picking what needed to be picked. There was a crop of heirloom tomatoes that were especially ready. They were a deep purple color and quite plump. Ino said, I bet Sasuke-kun would like these a lot because tomatoes are his favorite food. Hinata didn't say much because she didn't want to bring up the Uchiha. So, I said, and here came the fishing trip. Not many people know much about Naruto, and I didn't think he was close to any of the rookies besides Shikamaru and Shino, so why did he choose you to take care of his secret garden? Like I've told you before, Ino, he didn't have many choices and knew I liked flower pressing. He thought I could handle it, but I knew better, which is why I asked you. But he did trust you a little, since you need a seal to get in here. I suppose he does. How did you do it? We talked, you know. The story is the same. We had dinner and just talked after we worked out together. Must have been some talk. I've tried talking to Sasuke-kun for years and it's never gone anywhere. One night, you're getting keys to the apartment. Maybe I should take lessons, Ino said with a shite-eating grin. Why does getting keys matter so much, Nisama? It sounds like Ino is saying that Naruto likes me in a romantic way. Does he? No, Imauto, he doesn't. Ino just makes things up too much. That's good, since Neji Nason doesn't like him anyway. Don't let Neji's feelings control you too much, Hanabi-chan. He hates getting wet in the rain, so it's not that strange that he hates someone. Hi, Kiro Kurosawa stayed at the Shimmering Leaf, which is one of the nicest hotels in Konoha. A young man who used to be handsome had brown hair and a slim build. He had a boyish face, and his eyes were forest green. He was 5'8", which wasn't very tall but also wasn't too short. He had been able to get many women to like him because of how he looked and because he was the leader of Ishval. But that was 30 years ago, since that evil creature came to Ishval. People called him the Crimson Tiger, but Akiro knew that the boy wasn't a beast but something worse. He looked at himself in the bathroom mirror and cursed about how he'd lost everything. His kimono and sash were both made of the best silks from his home country. He used to be proud of the fact that people thought he was a noble from one of the major lands. A clever and sophisticated tactician. But few of the things that made him feel proud were still there, and he couldn't help but curse his fall. He was happy at first that his plan to get Kashimaru and Rega to attack the Leaf Ninja had worked. These two were too busy trying to find the squad, which was even harder because the resistance forces and the Kanoha ninja were working together. What could be better than that? All of his enemies were busy and getting weaker, but it seems like the demon took what the resistance fighters said to heart, since they probably told him stories about how they were mistreated, how they worked hard for not much, and how their leader kept most of the money for himself. As if they couldn't understand what it means to be a leader. It took a lot of work, so it deserved a lot in return. No one went hungry because they all had enough. Why was enough not enough? Because they were rude and self-centered. He didn't have a soft heart like his father, so he wasn't going to give away all of his money. Because they were selfish, they let that thing loose on him. The boy and another person were smuggled out of Ishval, but they still had time to set a trap in his office. Only the worn floorboards of his office on the second floor kept him from dying in the fire that broke out. But he didn't come out of it unscathed. About three quarters of his body was burned. Now, the left side of his face was messed up, and he needed a cane to help him walk. So, it took them so long to get to Konoha because he had to use a carriage to get himself and his samurai there. He was a loyal fool who took the Iron Country rules way too seriously, but he could be useful. Akira wanted Yuzumaki Naruto to be killed before he left. The man had already lost his position, so the old Hokage couldn't do anything to stop him. He remembers how the old man scared him so easily, as if everyone in front of those old eyes were just ants that he could squash or spare at will. He talked about how the payments Konoha had been getting for the past year weren't enough to make up for what he'd done and how soon a team of administrators from the Fire Country's Daimyo would be here to help with the transfer of power. 
he would be just one of many voices in a land that was supposed to be his. It was a put down. No, it went further than that. It was bad language. Akiro hated the Hokage and the missing Nin, but he hated the Yuzumaki more than anything else. If he had just died, Akiro wouldn't have lost anything but the chance to get even with him. The Suma Saru Tobai sat in a training field and tried to make lightning strike in his hand. It had been about a month since he got a note delivered from a short-tempered panther that wasn't inclined to give his name. That he delivered said note in the middle of the night, in Asuma's bedroom with nothing having been disturbed meant the former guardian ninja didn't sleep well. The note, from Naruto, stated if he wanted to learn the supersonic chakra flow he'd have to, at the very least, compete the first nature transformation exercise for lightning. Progress had been minimal. When one is used to using their chakra in specific ways, using them in different ways is akin to trying to write with your non-dominant hand except you have that feeling of wrongness throughout your entire body. Asuma had just managed to give himself several chakra burns. Aw, oh, damn it. He near shouted but the beautiful Jinjutsu mistress only giggled in response. She'd been back for two weeks as her boys were sent on an additional mission to the land of tea. She'd seen Asuma struggle and could sympathize. Getting used to using elemental jutsu was incredibly difficult for her but she pushed through and gotten both of her elements, earth and fire, back under control. It made both Jounin respect the Sandame for managing to learn and master every element. They were simply left in awe of Naruto, having beat the Sandame's record by a decade. If I didn't know any better I'd sear the kid was trolling me. Just complete the first exercise of the competing chakra nature, that's the easy part he wrote. From how he explained it to me, the next step really is some order of magnitude more difficult. He speculated it might be the effects of yin chakra, that we can limit ourselves by our beliefs and those beliefs get engraved in our bodies. If, on some level, you don't think this is possible then it won't be. Ugh, he sounds like how dad was when I was a kid. It's not easy accepting your father is both the god of shinobi who could kick your ass on his worst day and also a geek. Speaking as someone that is heavily involved in the mental arts, I'll try not to take offense. Kirin I huffed, playfully. Ah, uh, you know I wasn't talking about you. Jinjutsu is cool, hell I'm sure the brat can do some interesting things. It's hearing the thought process behind it that's geeky. Didn't he write something on the battle implications of the shunshin? Kirin I laughed, yes, he did. We all thought he was being a little much when he gave us a copy. See, just like dad, Asuma said and then frowned as he tried, once again, to generate lightning. How are you and your father? Outside of work we haven't spoken. I just can't deal with him. It was Kirinai's turn to frown as she sat up and looked Asuma in the eyes. I won't try to justify what he did but it was decades ago and given what's on the horizon you may not have much time to resolve your issues. Asuma bit down on his unlit cigarette, a silent concession to her argument. I can't disagree with that. I also can't deal with him. He used to tell all of us about how we had to sacrifice time with him for the village, how it pained him to be away from us. My mom always defended him, to the point she sometimes strained her relationship with us. And for what? So he can do the most cliched thing a person in his position could do. So much of my life has revolved around choices Haruzen Sarutobai made, I just had to deal with it. I came to terms with some of it, ignoring he didn't have to stay Hokage as long as he did. But this, to betray my mom when she was his champion, when she was likely missing him just as much as we were, and look at the results. Also he could feel like a big man, then say that. I'm not saying forgive him, only don't leave things unsaid. I don't want you to regret it and have to carry it. If nothing else, at least you can avoid that. I can't make any promises. But let's change the topic, when are your brats due back? Sometime today, Kirin I said, solemnly. What's wrong? Sandame Sama is going to finally inform Naruto of his responsibilities as a Jinchuriki during wartime. Shit. Day. Also, the leader of Ishval, that mission that went so wrong for Naruto while he was a reservist is still in the village and I'm afraid Naruto may cut him down on sight. That would not be good for his profile. It wouldn't. Hopefully, after he meets with Sandame Sama he'll just return to Orochimaru's and avoid any trouble. Kirinai said, having zero faith in her luck. Naruto-san, you've been really quiet. Shino observed as the trio ate breakfast before starting their final push into Kanoha. It wouldn't take long to arrive to the village as they'd kept an impressive pace before stopping the night before. As they ate, the Aburam and Nara noticed their teammates seemed lost in thought. It wasn't unusual but the periods of silence often resulted in something novel so Shino was curious what could be formulating in the redhead's mind. Oh, sorry, he said, scratching the back of his head. I was just thinking, when that AI bastard activated the rage in no Ken, if he'd been in a dust cloud of coal he'd have blown himself up. 
I was wondering if I could create a jutsu to do so. Just think, a trap jutsu against Raiden users from the element that is weakest against it. The other two boys perked up at the thought. If he had, we'd have lost a treasure of the village. Shikamaru started, pointing to the lightning sword clipped to Naruto's waist and then followed up with, what would be the complications? Shikamaru asked, very few daten are performed by strictly internal manipulation. The chakra is generally directed toward the ground, but a dust cloud would be released from the mouth, I'd imagine. To try to do it from the ground would just seem too uncontrollable. Naruto started. Another issue is getting the correct rock type and then into dust. Sounds troublesome. Potentially, I won't know until I start the process. Sometimes the manipulation is easier than you think it'll be. If it works, I likely won't keep it a clan technique, given our status with Kumo and the abundance of Dotten users. That would certainly endear you to many of the forces. Shino observed. For some reason, I doubt it. Naruto replied then started breaking down camp. His squadmates only frowned slightly in acknowledgement of his words, not liking that their upbeat teammate didn't have much faith in his comrades. Three medics and a mad scientist sit around Orochimaru's rectangular kitchen table. After Naruto's query about the poison mist jutsu Orochimaru thought it wise to enlist the help of Tsunade and Shizun. They'd likely take a different approach than either she or Kabuto would. It didn't take long for Tsunade to conclude the original jutsu was a necrotoxin, meant to cause rapid and expansive cellular death. The challenge was to adapt that to other types. It seemed all were energized by this new puzzle. Orochimaru had managed to create a myotoxin, one mimicking some of her summons. She could even control if it simply paralyzed or was eventually fatal. Tsunade and Shizune were able to create a neurotoxin variant. The meeting was to decide where else to take their project and who they'd teach, if any, these new techniques. While all the women were infused with their progress, Kabuto quietly fumed that the inspiration for this was Naruto, someone he was convinced was in need of promote removal. He hated how his mistress wouldn't even consider using live subjects to test her new jutsu. She claimed it was not worth the risk as they were still being watched but he suspected it was because her newest student wouldn't approve. As if his opinion mattered in the slightest. Kabuto-kun, would you like to join us? Sorry, Orochimaru-sama. The former spy said, adjusting his glasses as he did, which did not go unnoticed. As I was saying, these aren't like elemental ninjutsu. Having a high degree of scientific knowledge is necessary to properly form the jutsu. That really only leaves Uryonin to learn them. Anko would have sufficient knowledge. She deals with poisons and I trained her well in the sciences. Anko-san may be ideal. Unfortunately, from what Tsunade-sama and I have witnessed, we have a lot of medics but virtually no combat medics in the regular forces. I'd hesitate teaching a non-combatant these and I can't estimate how long it'd take them to get back up to par. Shizun stated before taking a sip of teach from the floral pattern cup. Agreed. Tsunade said, annoyed. We've got a new crop, from Chunin to Genin but they are still learning the basic Sobi rank jutsu that could harm them if not performed correctly, I just can't see it. What about you? She asked the snake Sanin. Mine roughly mimic the venom of my summons so having a close bond with the snakes would make it easier. I'll pass on a scroll to Anko as I doubt she'd welcome my presence. But as for your versions, Karin would be able to manage it. She's no Genin, I assure you of that. I'll consider it. It'd be nice to share something with my cousin clan. So, what's next? Shape manipulation. Orochimaru said and then laughed when all three medics hung their heads. It's a truism but medics are complete and total crap at advanced shape manipulation. I'll get Naruto-kun to contribute if neither of you mind. Great, he'll have a six-headed poison bird flying around in no time. Kabuto muttered absent-mindedly, causing Orochimaru to put eyes on him. Tsunade quirked her brow and Shizune frowned in response. Sounds like someone is jealous of your new student. What's wrong? Brat, sensei not giving you enough personal attention. Tsunade teased. Kabuto would normally glare at someone that mocked him but he liked having his head attached to his body so he decided to play along. I'll admit, it is difficult not to feel inadequate around Naruto-kun. To be so gifted at such an age. Hyukuku, fret not, Kabuto-kun. Your talents may lie elsewhere but they are considerable. The foursome finished their meeting and the slug Sanin departed with her student. While she had placated him then, Orochimaru had no intention of doing so now that they were alone. We clearly need to talk, Kabuto-kun. About what, Orochimaru-sama? The question earned him the kusanagi to his throat. Have you grown so arrogant as to think you can play dumb with me, boy? The white snake asked, pressing the blade just hard enough it wouldn't draw blood. Kabuto did a small shake of his head and she withdrew her sword. Now, what is your problem? The medic knew he couldn't say what he really wanted to, that the red-haired Uzumaki was dulling her blade. 
that he was a bad influence on her, changing her in small but noticeable ways and he hated it. That he missed twisting lower life forms as they laid, helpless, on a cold steel table. Then an idea struck him. I feel restless, Orochimaru Sama. When I was a double agent there was at least the risk of that, as well as being able to do our work. But now, I'm a genin. The Sandame isn't going to promote me in retaliation for being a spy. The only thing that saves me is your pardon. I need something to do, I'm going stir crazy. I'm sorry, Hyukuku, I can relate. I detest when things stagnate. I'll see if I can arrange a mission for you, something nice and bloody. How's that sound? Like just what I need, Orochimaru sama. I'll set it up but don't you have a shift at the hospital? Yes, I do. I'll leave now. Kabuto stated and vacated the manor. Orochimaru wasted no time summon a snake, a puff adder that was brown with specks of black. Orochimaru looked down the small snake and relayed her orders. Go to Giran Chan. Tell her I believe Kabuto may be planning to betray me. Tell her to make the necessary preparations and wait for confirmation. The snake dispelled itself and she continued to sit at her table, now deep in thought. Kabuto would be recognized as her second in command by most but truthfully, she's never trusted the spy. He worked for someone attempting to kill her and his greatest skill is his duplicity. But he believed he was her most trusted, most relied on subordinate. Kabuto likely believes he knows more about her plans and her network than anyone else. He knows a tiny fraction and she had kept track of how much he knew so if he ever turned on her. All of his information could be rendered moot as she burned those segments. Only Kimamero and Guren had her full faith as far as subordinates went, and both had the good sense to never be jealous of Naruto. He was different and meant for more. Kabuto had seemingly forgotten this or just disliked it enough to consider rebelling. It was a shame, he was a talented medic and researcher. He hadn't maximized his potential but if he were committed to betraying her then Kabuto would meet a slow and painful end. His ability to self-heal would only prolong his suffering. Her only true concern was that Kabuto wouldn't target herself but Naruto. She'd simply watch and wait as this might just be adolescent petulance. A samurai, trained in Iron Country by the famed Edo Iron Wolf Watanabe, sat just inside the check-in gate of Konoha. He'd do this periodically, waiting for his target and it seemed his steadfastness and patience had finally paid off. Three preteens were at the gate and he could finally complete the task given to him by his new lord. One of the boys had horrible posture for an alleged warrior and looked incredibly lazy. Another, covered up in a large jacket with his eyes guarded by darkened glasses just seemed to want to fade into the background. But it was the last one, the short one in a flak jacket similar to the lazy boy, except he had a sword strapped to his back red hair down to his shoulders and three whisker marks on each cheek. This was the alleged fearsome warrior that had caused such damage. It was somewhat hard to believe but as a trained samurai he knew ninja could do some truly incredible things. Nothing a true samurai had to worry about. Like many of the initiates of Iron Country, he believed shinobi could not stand up to them in direct combat but only win through disreputable and honorless methods. That's why he planned to challenge the boy directly. A part of him distressed at killing one so young. The boy had chosen his path and must walk it to its very end. He put his hand on the hilt of his sword, preparing to walk toward the so-called tiger but the boy disappeared in a blur, leaving only his teammates to come through the gate. He approached the two boys, his back straight, his gait smooth but purposeful. He would always display his pride as a swordsman, a warrior and would use it to intimidate the two youngsters. Excuse me, may I have a word? He asked, his face emotionless. Regarding what? The covered up boy asked. That boy that just departed, was he Uzumaki Naruto? Without missing a beat, the lazy boy asked, Troublesome, why do you want to know? We have a private matter to settle and it cannot be delayed. He said, grip tightening on his sword. The boys made a face, he assumed they were debate whether or not to tell him. Konoha Shinobi don't give information about their comrades to strangers. If you want to meet Uzumaki Naruto you should go to the Hokage so he can set it up. The lazy boy said, I may not be able to get a meeting with your leader and this is time sensitive. If that was Naruto-san, you'd do well to tell me now so I can be on my way. Forgive me, but that sounded like a threat. Are you threatening us, Samurai-san? The other boy, he'd almost forgot was there, asked. Now, he was receiving the attention of others and realized it was in his interest not to press things further. If you know Naruto-san, please have him meet me at the Shimmering Leaf, it would be appreciated. And the swordsman walked away. He never did give us a name. Shino observed. Troublesome, we better report this. Shikamaru said before a weasel masked ANBU appeared before them. It is already known, Nara-san. You may go about your day. He said dryly and shunshined away. Troublesome, Shino, that's my line. 
Naruto entered the Hokage's office with an impassive face, the one he always adopted when dealing with the old man. He was surprised to see his advisors and Tsunade in attendance. It, he reasoned, explained why he was requested to report directly to the Hokage alone. He stepped forward and greeted the Hokage formally. The man didn't visibly react, but it still hurt that his bond with Naruto was gone. However, they had more important matters and it'd be another indictment on his foolishness. Thank you for getting here so promptly, Naruto-kun. As you can surmise, I didn't call you here for a debriefing on a standard C rank. Instead, I am here to inform you of some important information. Naruto kept his impassive facade but internally wondered what could be so important to him specifically. The Hokage, after taking a moment, continued, As you know, soon we will be in a state of war, officially. When that happens, you as a Jinchuriki will no longer be in the traditional chain of command. All hidden villages do this, we just don't let it be known who our Jinchuriki are. In fact, until it is declared the war has ended you'd be under the direct command of the sitting Hokage. Your status, Naruto, would be equal to the Jounin and ANBU commanders, Hamura added. During the Third Shinobi War, your mother was not on the battlefield for long. Instead she was in charge of domestic security. Her few injutsu knowledge and talent with barriers made her ideal for keeping Konoha safe from any parties trying to attack us directly. Most of the Shinobi forces that knew her were too afraid to contradict her and none questioned her status when Haruzen gave the order. Koharu stated, we haven't decided what your overall status would be but I am leaning towards Chunin Commander. You should start studying strategy and tactics in case. You should also keep in mind, there will be pushback but you'll have to find a way to navigate it. Haruzen